Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. I think we're ready to go. So today's training is uh, specifically for working with the unsheltered population and outreach. Um, Clean and Safe is with us in chambers, and I know there's a city staff um, watching as well. Um, without further ado, John and Mark, if you want to introduce yourselves, I think your experience um, will lend to um, augmenting our outreach efforts and also developing new strategies um, as a community. So thank you so much for joining us. All right. Well, thank you so much for having us today as well. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I, I've got um, a, a good amount of experience working with some of the providers in Reno and particularly the CARES campus. And I've seen a lot of the changes that have happened over the past couple of years and seen a lot of great pieces put into place. And I think street outreach is, is clearly going to be the next best piece to put in there. So uh, without further ado, Today, we are going to share with you uh, not only some best practices involved in creating street outreach, uh, working with people in a street outreach setting, but also um, ways to engage people, the differences between some of the most popular forms of outreach and how we can really use street outreach as a tool to end homelessness rather than just managing homelessness. So my name is John DeCarmine, I'm the principal consultant with JD Consultancy. I also have the honor of serving as the executive director of GRACE in Gainesville, Florida. GRACE is a, a one-stop homeless assistance center and a low barrier emergency shelter. We provide 146 beds of emergency shelter every night. We have 61 units of permanent housing. Uh, we overall have been open for the past eight years and uh, in part due to the work that Mark, my friend and colleague on the call with me today has done, we have been able to reduce unsheltered homelessness in our community by almost 70% over the past eight years. Uh, and by doing that, we have also been able to kind of clear some of the backlog in the homeless housing assistance network, get more people into housing through all programs. and. Um, overall be housing focused and trauma informed in all of our engagements with people on the street. Uh, so let me hand it over to Mark to just briefly introduce himself and then we'll get started. Hello, my name is Mark Watson. Um, I've been working with uh, people who live outside for over 10 years now in various capacities. Um, I've done some legal work with, uh, with folks that live outside. Uh, I've done uh, ma the majority of it has been outreach, specifically street. And we were able to start a, uh, uh, an outreach project, which I have a staff of seven people total. Um, prior to that, it was just one or two of us doing street outreach. And in that time, we've been able to, uh, to house 88 people um, straight from the streets into housing. Um, we've got a uh, People dock ready so that they're prepped and ready to go on the coordinated entry list. So as housing arises, and it's it's huge. Street outreach is the missing piece. Thank you all for letting me come today, and uh, thanks, John. Looking forward right. to it. Okay, um, and I just want to clarify: despite what it may look like on your screen, um, not everybody at Grace is a tall white guy with a beard. Um, we do have a wonderfully diverse staff, a team of about 62 people who are involved in what we do. We just happened to bring the, the two best beards to you today. So here's what we're going to cover today. By the end of this training, uh, you should be able to describe and implement best practices for street outreach and describe how you can work with people and build rapport and relationships in a meaningful and trauma-informed way. And we're gonna go over um, extensively what that might look like on a day-to-day -day, um, interaction scale. You should be able to describe what street outreach is, but also how it functions as a piece of the bigger homelessness assistance network in your community. And then we're going to spend some time so that you can put in place key outcome measures to know if what you're doing is successful because we are coming at this from the perspective of having been in this work, uh, I've been doing this work for 25 years at this point and, and most street outreach I have seen 
it isn't effective. We, we put it, we treat it as a frontline staff position or an introductory position. You know, hey, you're new to working with people without housing. Why don't we just put you in this unsupervised role where you wander around town and talk to people? We treat it as a minimum wage position or something other than a situation where people are trained as professionals and paid as professionals. And, and we treat it as something that is measured in how many people we talk to rather than how many people we've actually moved from homelessness into housing. So we'll spend some time at the end of this talking through what those key outcome measures could be so you can kind of benchmark your program and know if it's working and where and how you can improve it. Um, before we move to the next slide, um, just a quick question. If there are questions from the audience, would you prefer to have those during the presentation or during uh, a break at the end? If there, so that's a great question. If I, with our screen shared, it's difficult for us to also monitor the chat window. And um, Cynthia, you are the only person I can see in my Zoom room. So if, if you don't right. mind either chiming in with those questions, if they seem relevant to what's up on the screen at that time, that's absolutely fine. We'll also make sure we save at least 30 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And so there, there may be some of you out there who are really good at being on trainings and webinars on Zoom for extended periods of time. I am not one of those people. Uh, we will probably break this training into roughly 45 minute chunks and then we'll take a five or 10 minute break after each major section. So there will be opportunities to get up, to stretch, to wander around. Um, just wanted you to know that in advance. We're not planning on going straight through for the full three hours. So what we're gonna to cover today, and, and these are kind of the, the two core pieces. We're gonna talk Outreach 101. What is the difference between somebody you may come across in shelter and, and somebody out on the street? What are the best practices that are going to inform all of the work you do as a street outreach worker? Uh, some of this may be a little bit elementary for some of you, but as I understand it, some of you are relatively new to this and, and some of these approaches. So we'll kind of give a brief overview of what those best practices are and how they show up in a street outreach setting. We'll move from there into engagement strategies and talking about who does what. And particularly, we're going to spend some time talking about that distinction between somebody who might be in a supportive role and somebody who is finding themselves in more of an enforcement role, whether that's a public work setting or somebody who's got to help um, clear a street or clear a camp. And what are those key differences and how does it affect your street outreach relationship with somebody? Um, the goal with this is that by the end of the day, you feel comfortable not only approaching people, but understanding how you might be able to serve them directly or connect them to other services in your community that will allow them to move closer to housing and further away from homelessness. And then we'll wrap up uh, again, getting back to those key key outcomes. Uh, we'll talk about what it looks like to hit the tipping point as you're getting more and more people into housing and then that time for questions and answers. So we're going to start with everything kind of flowing from these three key statements. Only housing ends someone's homelessness. And as opposed to the old models of homeless service delivery, where we would put somebody in a shelter or we'd leave them out on the street and we would say things like, once you have done this and this, what, once you have taken an anger management class and a life skills class and you've gotten a job and you've not had a drink in 30 days and all these different things, then we would believe that somebody deserved housing. We're starting from the assumption that everybody deserves housing. We're also starting from a place where everyone is ready for housing right now. Everybody who you come into contact with out on the street has had housing at some point in their life. And it's not so much about whether somebody needs to be made ready for housing, it is about whether we can provide the appropriate supports to people once they are in housing. So you'll hear us talk about housing first, uh, but, but housing first, I want to stress, is not housing only. It just means that housing is the first piece of the puzzle we need to put in place from which all other services, supports, anything else we do becomes easier to provide to somebody, more effective, more cost effective, and everything else. So these are the three kind of core philosophical tenets that are driving everything else that we're talking about. 
Housing is the only thing that we can actually provide that will make somebody who is currently homeless not homeless anymore. So moving right in to Outreach 101, and, and based on, on the experience levels of folks in the crowd, um, I wanna just kind of give a broad overview of, of what it means to conduct street outreach. What you're doing basically is taking all of the best services that you have available in the community and providing connections to people who exist outside of the shelter system, people who can't get into shelter due to some barriers that might be in place in those shelters, people who won't come into shelter based on previous bad experiences that they've had, based on uh, the decision that maybe they don't want to live in the case of the CARES campus with 600 other people, and they, they feel like they have some more privacy and some more um, opportunity for living the life that they're trying to live while they survive before getting into housing. Uh, street Outreach's job is to deliver those services to people wherever they may be. The overarching goal of Street Outreach is to reduce and end homelessness. It is not to give more people business cards or pamphlets or referrals to agencies. Um, there are some pieces of it that are involved that, in, that um, involve keeping people alive until you can get them into housing, uh, making the difficulties that they face in homelessness a little bit easier to deal with while you're waiting to get them into housing. But again and again, you're gonna hear us tie this back to what are we doing for somebody right now and how does this ultimately help us end their homelessness? Yeah, a prime example of that, John, if you don't mind me just hopping in. Please. Is, uh, um, so what I tell my staff and what I focus on is everything that we do is focused on housing. So if someone asks us for a pair of pants, um, our, our, our uh, question then might be, well, well, what is it that you need the pants for? And they would say, well, to wear them. Um, or I have a job interview. So then we realize, okay, this person has a job interview that might increase their income, that might move them one step closer to housing. So we get them the pants. Everything is based upon moving towards housing. Right. So, so everything is based on moving towards housing, but we can connect almost anything to advancing that housing progress. So as we talk about outreach, I think it's important to talk about how that fits into the broader housing crisis response system in the community. Um, you know, there's an intake and an assessment portion. How do we find out who we're working with? How do we figure out what their needs are? Traditionally, what this has looked like is, uh, this is known as your continuum of care and people would kind of graduate from one service to another. Uh, so that intake typically led into an emergency shelter. From that emergency shelter, uh, in the old model, you would graduate to transitional housing. Uh, at the shelter or at that transitional housing program, you would start to access other services like mental health treatment, job training, any kind of skills, whether that's life skills, financial skills, connecting with family, connecting with other supports, uh, improving your education. And from there, you would graduate into any number of housing interventions, permanent housing that you are paying for entirely on your own, permanent supportive housing where there is some case management component and some rent subsidy component, rapid rehousing, which is sort of a short-term intervention of six to 12 months where there's still some financial support and some case management support. But what happens is folks who may not want to go into an emergency shelter then, if, if they're missing that first step to enter into the continuum of care, they're never going to access those other services. There's, in fact, there weren't mechanisms built into the continuum of care to address that. And we kind of started to treat it as uh, almost this, this fault assigning thing where we would say, well, if the person doesn't come to shelter, they must not want housing and therefore they must want to be homeless. And, and from there, there are these philosophical leaps that we would take where we would say, well, they must not deserve housing or they, they must not be able to maintain housing or whatever else, you know, whatever other things we built in to justify the fact that there was a substantial number of people on the street who were not getting help despite these big, massive, expensive systems designed to provide supports to people. Street outreach is 
Absolutely beautiful because what Street Outreach does is it kind of jumps from any point of that continuum of care to any other point. So uh, you don't need to get into an emergency shelter in order to receive street outreach services. Street outreach does not need to tell you you must get into an emergency shelter if you want to receive the rest of those services. With street outreach, you are quite literally meeting people where they are, whether that's on the sidewalk or in a park or along the Truckee River or anywhere else. Um, and then you're doing what you can from there. So it's so your office is this outdoor setting where you are working with people directly using your own knowledge of what resources are available to help find the most appropriate supports for that person. So when we look at street outreach, there are some core components of any street outreach program. These programs are going to be systemic, coordinated, they're going to be comprehensive. So that means that it's a collaborative effort by multiple partners. Uh, it is something that provides critical connections. It's a collaborative effort. And it's not on behalf of one agency. It's on behalf of the entire community. It's going to leverage all of the community resources across the entire housing crisis response system. So as we are functioning in an outreach setting, your resources that you have directly available to you are not the only ones. You will become somewhat of a ninja in knowing what other resources are available and how you might be able to connect people to those resources. So sometimes that looks like basic needs and, and connecting people with places that provide food or shelter or clothing. Uh, even more often, I would say there is some opportunity to connect people with physical or mental or behavioral health care or agencies that can provide other supports for people. And then, of course, there's the housing resources. Not every outreach agency has housing resources attached to it, but you are all part of a continuum of care that does a, a pretty good job of assigning people based on their vulnerability to rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing, to diversion funds, to any other sort of um, support that would get people into um, the coordinated entry process, that would get people into whatever other way you have to get into housing. And as we said, it's connected to the coordinated entry process. We will go into that in more detail during the outreach and engagement component of the training. So outreach is also housing focused. I, I'll say this again, there, are, there is no number of meals or toothbrushes or tents or pairs of socks that you can give to somebody that will actually end their homelessness. And for too long, outreach has spent a lot of time saying, well, we know we're a good outreach program because we talked to 800 people last year. But if each of those 800 people that you spoke with have not ended their homelessness, then in fact, we haven't actually accomplished all that much. We've talked to 800 people, but we know that a good outreach program can do much more than that. So the primary goal is to connect people with the appropriate housing. And as we talked about just a couple slides back, this doesn't mean that somebody has to go into shelter. This doesn't mean that somebody has to enter a transitional housing program. In fact, that you may find is one of the biggest barriers that people don't want to participate in those programs or they're, they're told that they can't participate in those programs. So any opportunity we have to kind of jump from one to the other based on that person's need, the better off we're going to be. Housing focused also means we use that housing first approach. This is a best practice that is used throughout the country right now. It's actually required by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. And, and just to give you a brief overview of that, we think back to the old model, which was known as housing readiness. And this is when somebody would show up to shelter. And as, as I had mentioned, you know, we're saying, welcome to shelter. We're so glad you're here. Um, now that you're here, we need you to take a life skills class and an anger management class and a resume development class. And then we need you to get mental health care and substance abuse treatment. And after you have done all of those, then we will believe that you are ready for housing. The housing first approach says, and, and has research to support the idea that it's best to put somebody into housing first and then provide all of those services. So if you're 
out on the street and you are trying to deal with a mental health issue, trying to stabilize a mental health problem, it is always going to be more effective and more helpful for you to get into an apartment with a door you can close behind you and a door you can lock and a place you can put your stuff and a place you can feel safe and then start to deal with whatever you may need to do to stabilize that mental health issue than it would be if we were to move you into a shelter where you are one of 600 people also trying to stabilize a mental health issue all at the same time in a big loud setting. Um, what the research shows is it is always more effective to provide those kinds of services in somebody's house wherever possible. That doesn't mean you can't provide these services out on the street, but as a general rule, the more quickly we can get somebody into housing, the more effective every other intervention we will make will be. Outreach should be person-centered, trauma-informed, and culturally responsive. This means we're going to focus on what somebody is doing well, what supports they already have, and we're not going to spend a lot of time saying, well, they don't have this, so this can't happen. We're going to use evidence-based practices like trauma-informed care, and we're going to be respectful and responsive to their beliefs and their practices. This includes everything from sexual orientations, disability status, the language that they use, how old they are, what their cultural preferences are. Um, any of that, we are going to respond to that and we will shift and adjust our programs to meet those needs rather than insisting that they change their beliefs or their practices to meet the needs of our program. And then as we get into the final pieces of these core components, we want to make sure that we are emphasizing safety and reducing harm for people out on the street. So this involves having protocols in place to ensure the safety of everyone. And we will spend a, a good amount of time later on talking about safety protocols for you while you're out on the street. Uh, this includes using harm reduction principles, whether that is um, recognizing somebody's strengths or the benefits of them cutting down on their drinking rather than demanding total abstinence, seeing if there are ways that whatever behaviors they have going on can be adjusted with our help so that they are less likely to cause harm to that person. Um, and some of it is just understanding that people are going to do what they're going to do. And if we want to see change, we need to provide some opportunities while working around the situation that they're in now to help them get to the place that we want them to get. And we're gonna stay focused on housing while doing all of this. And, and we'll talk more about this as we go through. So these are your kind of core components, emphasizing safety and harm, being part of that broader homeless response system, staying housing focused, and then being trauma-informed and person-centered. So from here, let's talk about what a typical street outreach engagement might look like. Um, for somebody to be out on the street, as I said, we kind of have these old models of what does what is the original way of providing street outreach look like. Um, the contact and survival approach is really focused on helping people survive by providing basic needs to them. It is focused on um, providing things like food or tents or healthcare to on in a limited basis, um, referrals to other agencies, doing things like that. You're, you're helping somebody's homelessness be more comfortable. Every once in a while, you are connecting them with other agencies. You're helping people survive. And at the end of the day, there's really no long game on this. There's no long-term focus. It makes the experience of living outside easier for people. And there is a place for that, but it is not actually going to have any end result in terms of people becoming housed. It's not going to have any change on the visibility of homelessness in your community. It's not going to do anything for the long-term health or, or mental health or substance use of people because they're still in a crisis situation 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The alternative to that is looking at outreach as a solutions focused and in, and in the context of homelessness that basically means a housing focused setting. So the focus on this, not to put too fine a point on it, is moving people into housing. 
Um, it weaves those non-housing focused basic needs to existing agencies, connecting people, making sure they're aware where they can go for socks or for clothing or for food. Um, but at the end of the day, the conversations, the goal, the intention is looking at what can be done so that this person is not homeless any longer. And many programs operate in a sort of a hybrid setting, but we're focusing today primarily on the solutions focused portion of this that will end up getting somebody off the street and back into housing. Uh, there will be times throughout your day where it feels like you're doing more contact and survival stuff. And then other times when it feels like you're doing more um, housing engagement stuff, as Mark had mentioned earlier, there's always a way that you can kind of tie what you're doing back to housing. Um, at the most extreme example, it would be great if somebody was still alive when their name got called on the housing list. So what can we do to, to help them survive longer, knowing that there's an end in sight? But the solutions focus part of this makes the continuum of assistance very clear. And it starts with an initial engagement and it ends with the placement of somebody into permanent housing and then lining up whatever appropriate follow-up care is needed. I also find it very helpful to uh, to focus on the solutions part of it, to mainly re remind myself that there's only so much time in a day that, that you can help somebody. So um, we, we really need, because we have a limited amount of outreach workers in the community, um, we really need to focus on those specific interactions that do lead towards somebody um, moving inside. And, and especially if resources already exist in the community for, for food and basic need, item, need items as well. Then why duplicate that service? So um, it just makes it easier to do our jobs. Absolutely. Uh, Mark, it, at some point, we may have to have you turn your camera off just because it seems like you're kind of quipping in and out just a little bit, but I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, so who are we working with? Who, what, what's the difference between somebody who is unsheltered and somebody who is in a shelter, for example? Um, we know that compared to the sheltered population, uh, we're more likely to see individuals as opposed to members of families with children or other households in the shelter system. So on the street nationally, about 93% of unsheltered individuals are, are not members of families with children. People who live outside tend to be homeless four times longer than their sheltered counterparts. Uh, people are more likely to be disconnected from formal employment. This doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have work, uh, but it's not necessarily work that pays a living wage. It's not necessarily work that is steady and regular where they're showing up three or four or five days a week. Instead, it's more piecemeal and there's some less formal ways of, of, of gaining income when you're unsheltered. Compared to the sheltered population, folks on the street are significantly more likely to have mental health problems, physical health problems, and behavioral health challenges and what we know is the longer somebody stays out on the street, the more problems they have and the worse the problems they already have become. So, so it's more beneficial for the person, for the homeless service system, for the city, for the county, for the hospital system, for everybody to get people off the streets as quickly as possible to start to stabilize some of those issues. Uh, people who are living unsheltered are more likely to have involvement with the legal system. The vast majority have no kinds of um, past violent offenses. In fact, they're more likely to be involved with the legal system as victims of crimes than they are as perpetrators of crimes. But repeatedly, we do see um, consistently more involvement with the legal system when people are living unsheltered. And then compared to the sheltered population, folks living unsheltered are 25 times more likely to be trimorbid. Trimorbidity is uh, the co-occurrence of physical health problems, mental health problems, and substance misuse issues. So those three things together uh, create not only major problems for people on the street, they make it incredibly difficult to find or sustain employment. They make it more difficult to um, really move forward in any number of ways 
And, and again, at, at a 25 times higher rate, we will see this repeatedly for people out on the street. And in terms of what this looks like in your community, uh, the continuum of care of Northern Nevada has seen an 875% increase in unsheltered homelessness since 2017. And, and there's probably nobody who's aware of this more than all of you. Uh, the numbers, I want to say, jumped from about 80 people living unsheltered in 2017 up to 780 or so in 2021. And I believe in 2022, the most recent point in time count of people without housing in Reno found an even higher number in 2022. So on one hand, this is an enormous increase and it feels overwhelming. On the other hand, 780 people is still a solvable number, 800 people uh, of your total homeless population. This is not something that is so out of hand that it can't be addressed with the right tools and the right pieces in place. Sean, I have a quick question from sure. an attendee. Um, on your previous slide, you talked about tri uh, morbid morbidity. Um, and the question is, if homeless individuals are homeless because they are trimorbid, or does homelessness cause it? You're one slide ahead of me, maybe two slides ahead of me. So, so okay. we'll will, we will touch on that in just a minute. Great. And then for our, everyone um, tuning, in, tuning in, the uh, point in time count for our region, um, those numbers have not been released. Um, but once they come in, we'll be sure to share it with our organization um, for the most recent count. Yeah, I think the, the last one, the unofficial numbers, it was pushing a thousand um, for unsheltered. And, and I, I'll actually go ahead and address the trimorbidity piece right now. It, the answer is both. Uh, people who have overwhelming health problems, mental health problems, substance use issues, um, that can be a cause of homelessness, absolutely, particularly if that person doesn't have any resources. On the other hand, what is more likely is that those problems, th those things that may have been smaller problems when somebody becomes homeless, tend to get worse the longer somebody stays outside. So, so it, it's not unheard of for extended hospital stays to cause somebody to lose jobs, which causes them to lose housing, which causes them to slide into a crippling depression and start drinking or, or their drinking intensifies. On the other hand, what we see more likely is that people show up on the street and as time goes by, you know, they're exposed to the elements, whether that's heat or cold, they fall down, they're victims of crimes, all these different things that can um, exacerbate mental health problems, fear, past traumas, everything like that. So, so it's a little bit of both, but more often what we see is that those problems worsen as somebody's out on the street. And as we kind of roll into the best practices section, I, I want you to think about this because it's, it is so easy for us to think all kinds of things about unsheltered people. Um, you know, in our community, we hear it all the time that, you know, gosh, I was, I was on my way home from work on the way to the bar, and I saw this guy drinking a beer over at the bus stop. And that's why they're homeless, because they're just sitting at a bus stop drinking beer. But if we look a little bit more closely at that, the person who's making that complaint was just doing the same thing. They were leaving a day of work, which the person out of the bus stop very well could have been doing. They were headed to a bar to have a beer after work. And which is the same thing that this person was doing. They're just doing it out at a bus stop because that's the only space they have available to them. But unsheltered folks have to live their private lives publicly. If, if I want to have a beer after work, I have the luxury of going to a bar to be at the bar in a socially acceptable place to be drinking and nobody would think twice about it. If a person's just finished up at a job site or just finished up at a retail job and they have no place else to go, they're going to have that beer in a park or at a bus stop. And it's that, that public nature of people's private lives that unfortunately makes it very easy for people to, to pass judgment on unsheltered people. Similarly, if I am going to have a disagreement with my partner 
I have the privilege of closing a bedroom door behind me before I have that conversation. I don't have to do it on the city bus. I don't have to have that conversation in the library because it's the only place that we have to go. So very often what we see um, in the unsheltered population, uh, including severe mental health issues, there are many, many more people with severe and persistent mental illness living housed than there are people living on the street. Now, proportionally, it may look like a greater percentage of people without housing have mental health issues because they're more public, they're more visible. Uh, but at the end of the day, we know that about 20% of people in the general population have some kind of, uh, deal with some kind of struggle with mental health. Those numbers are not that far off from the percentage of people in the homeless population who deal with the same issues. The primary issue is that it is so much more visible when somebody without housing is dealing with those issues. So with these folks out here on the street, you know, the first question might be, gosh, you know, we just built a brand new shelter. Why don't people go into shelter? Um, what is it that's keeping somebody out on the street? And this is an untechnical reason, but most shelters kind of suck. If you are out on the street and you've got a group of four or five people who watch out for each other, who are taking care of each other, if one person can find food, they'll share it with everybody else. Um, you have some privacy. You only have to share all of your personal you know, space and, and goings on with five people or 10 people or 20 people. That's gonna be preferable for a lot of people. Um, rather than them having to have those interactions with hundreds of people or, or dozens of people at minimum in some of your smaller shelters. So when people are asked, why don't you go into shelter? Um, some people have been rejected by shelters and, and told that the behavioral issues that they present with are too difficult. Um, when people really start talking about what it is that keeps them out of shelter, they talk about three things. They talk about people, they talk about pests, and they talk about policies. So on the people front, that is, you know, there are too many people there. We have guys who we work with in street outreach who I have said, hey, look, you know, finally there's a shelter where you can show up and you'll be allowed in because the other ones wouldn't let you in because you had beer on your breath. And he says, you know what, I'm still not going. There's way too many homeless people up there. Uh, when it comes to pests, uh, living outside is is not a picnic, but at the same time, you know, people, it's not uncommon for shelters to have to deal with bed bugs. It's not uncommon for jumping to other kinds of pests, for shelters to be filled with people who will steal your, steal your stuff, people who will have their own issues going on that make it difficult for you to feel safe or for you to feel stable. So there are good reasons why people choose not to come into shelter. So that we, we talked a little bit about the people, a uh, little bit about the policies, um, but or a little bit about the pests, but then there's the policies part of it. There are barriers to many emergency shelters around the country. And I will say the CARES campus does a good job of trying to reduce as many of these barriers as possible. But elsewhere, it's not uncommon for somebody to show up to a shelter and then immediately be told that they need to um, go get a police clearance before they're allowed in the shelter. It is also not uncommon for people to show up and then be told, well, if you can't pass a breathalyzer test, then we're not going to allow you into shelter. Or if you can't pass a drug test, or if you don't have a job, if you don't have income already, we're not going to let you into shelter. Um, if you've lost your identification, we're not going to let you into shelter. And, and for, a, for a set of systems that are designed to serve the most vulnerable people, what we see very often, unfortunately, is that emergency shelters make it very difficult to get life-saving assistance. Um, you know, think about that, where, where a shelter says, you are welcome to come to this shelter as soon as you have a job and you haven't had a drink in 30 days and you don't have any kind of criminal record. Well, that means that that shelter, for the most part, is letting people in who actually don't need their help. Those are the folks who are kind of the most high functioning, the least vulnerable, 
And when we have shelter systems that target only those folks, certainly they're easier to serve, but nobody really signs up for this work because they think it's going to be easy. You know, if you went to, if you called your doctor and your doctor said, I hear that you're sick, your, your leg hurts, you've got a cough, your heart's beating funny. As soon as all of those problems go away, then come into my office and we're going to help you with all of your problems. We would think that that was absolutely outrageous in a healthcare setting, but for some reason over the years, it's just now getting to the point where the emergency shelter system has realized that that is also outrageous. When we tell people, once you've solved all your problems, come on in and we're going to take credit for you solving your problems. So people don't see shelter because they don't want to go into shelter because they've been rejected by shelter because the shelter has told them they're too difficult to work with or because they have some greater degree of privacy or safety or security living with smaller numbers of people out on the street. So moving in to some of the best practices for street outreach programs, these are the things that we'll carry with us in our day-to-day -day engagements that, that really make all of the difference in the world. Uh, we'll talk briefly about trauma-informed care, harm reduction, progressive engagement, and motivational interviewing. And then I think at that point, we'll go ahead and take a quick break to give everybody a chance to, to move around and stretch. And maybe we'll try to build in a couple quick questions at the end of this section. So what is trauma-informed care? To start with, we have to understand that everybody that we work with has experienced at least one traumatic event, and that's homelessness. Homelessness is wildly traumatic for people. And what we know is that people very often have experienced many, many more. In fact, the trauma that exists from homelessness is the end result of multiple other traumas, whether that is uh, incarceration, incarceration of family members or loved ones, medical crises, uh, deaths of loved ones who they were the support network for or who were supporting them, experience in the foster care system, traumatic experiences in other shelters, uh, assaults, any number of things has led to somebody to the point where they are homeless. And we need to start with this assumption that everybody has, everybody has arrived with the baggage of substantial trauma with them. So when you think about trauma, one of the best descriptions I had ever heard of it, if you think about being in a place, being at the beach or being in a place where there's wet sand, you know, you can smack your hand into that sand and you will see the imprint of your hand in the sand. And if you pull your hand away, that imprint is still there. It doesn't matter that your hand, the traumatic experience for the sand is gone. It's been removed. You could have taken it away a minute ago, a second ago, or five minutes ago, but the imprint of that trauma still exists in the sand. The human brain works very much in the same way. Even if there is no current traumatic event, the existence of past traumatic events affects people in so many different ways. And that shows up sometimes in less healthy coping mechanisms. It shows up in quickness to get angry or to be irritable, uh, a very low frustration tolerance. It shows up in uh, sometimes problematic sexual behaviors or drug-seeking behaviors or things like that. Um, we need to recognize that there is some trauma history in every single person that we're working with. So trauma-informed care is, is a universal precaution for any outreach worker. In fact, when you think about what a paramedic does, if, a, if an EMT pulls up and they see that there is blood involved in whatever they're doing, the first thing they're gonna do is put on rubber gloves. We don't know that the person's blood has any kind of infectious agents in it. We don't know that that blood is going to spill on us, but as a universal precaution, just in case, we are going to put on rubber gloves. Trauma-informed care, is it, they, it is the rubber gloves for people working with people without housing. Even if we can't say for sure that a person has experienced a traumatic event, 
um, we are going to act as if they have to make sure that we are not re-traumatizing them and to make sure that we understand what the behavior, where those behaviors are stemming from. So in very many ways, trauma-informed care can be remembered as something that simply shifts every conversation you have uh, away from what's wrong with this person and toward what has happened to this person to get them to where they are today. So trauma-informed care, it, it involves how we communicate with people. It involves how we approach people. It involves how much space we give people when we're talking to them. It involves how understanding we can be when they raise their voice. It involves making sure that people are aware of what's happening and, and what's going to happen. If their tent is going to have to move, if they have an appointment you know, tomorrow at 10 a.m., it involves showing up the day before to say, hey, I just wanted to remind you, I'll be coming by tomorrow to talk to this person with you, and, and we're going to be showing up, as opposed to just showing up at 10 a.m. and surprising them with that. So trauma-informed care is, is sort of this way of being that changes everything about how we communicate with people and, and what we expect from people and what we offer to people. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration uh, kind of distills this down to the four R's, and they, they say the essence of trauma-informed care is first that we have to realize what trauma is, how it affects people, how it affects groups. Uh, we need to recognize the signs of trauma, and those are some of those things that I mentioned before. For some people, it's being really loud and aggressive because you grew up in a in a you grew up in poverty and you knew that in order to get the help that you needed at a social service agency you could either wait there for six or eight or ten hours hungry without knowing if you were going to get help or you could start to get loud and, and eventually draw people's attention to you so that you would get served immediately um for some people on the other side though the signs of trauma might be uh, a, a reluctance to talk to anybody a reluctance to share what is going on in their lives um, it can be quick reactions, it can be slow reactions, but all of it comes from past experiences that people had. So as a result, it's our job to build those systems that can respond appropriately. You know, if, if every single person in our shelter got kicked out because they forgot to say please, or they forgot to say thank you, or they yelled at somebody in the middle of having the worst day of their life, that shelter would be empty pretty quickly. So trauma-informed systems recognize that, that whatever's going on is so rarely about you and so much more often about whatever else has happened with that person. The final R from SAMHSA is that we need to resist re-traumatizing people. So re-traumatizing somebody in a street outreach setting, and you're going to hear this as a recurring theme, uh, starts with can people count on you? Do people believe that they can trust you? And if you have made a commitment to somebody, have you followed up on it? We want to make sure that we're not forcing people into situations that they are not comfortable being in. If uh, somebody tells you that they absolutely do not want to go to an emergency shelter because they had traumatic experiences happening there, we can't insist that they go to an emergency shelter simply because it might be a little bit easier to find them. Um, we need to build and change and adjust our systems and our approaches to make sure that it is working for people, again, rather than trying to make those people work for the systems that we already have in place. So another recurring theme you're going to hear is about harm reduction. Um, Harm reduction in a nutshell is what do we need to do? How can we work with people in a way that emphasizes safety and reduces harm? So, so these strategies meet people where, are, where they are, um, sometimes quite literally, sometimes emotionally, sometimes uh, in, in any number of other ways. And we're meeting people where they are on their own terms. When we meet people where they are on their own terms, uh, this can lead to additional prevention services, additional treatment services, additional recovery services, but harm reduction at its core means we don't just walk up to somebody and say, hey, look, you're using drugs. I can't work with you until you stop using drugs. 
the the simple fact of it is uh, substance use is common among unsheltered homeless people, but substance use is also common among people. So this is again, not something that is unique to people without housing. You may see it more because those folks are, are having to consume these substances outside on the sidewalk or on the bus or in a park. But at the end of the day, there is no shortage of substance abuse and substance use and substance misuse in the housed community. Just like there is no shortage, unfortunately, of men's violence against women or mental health problems or poverty or any other issue that you see in the unsheltered population, it's just better hidden. So harm reduction tries to meet people where they are. Um, it, uh, when we can engage with people and celebrate the strengths of what they're doing. And sometimes that's, hey, I noticed yesterday you were drinking 12 beers and today you only drank four. Congratulations, that is a great step forward. Um, insisting on abstinence, unfortunately, there is absolutely no research that shows that, that abstinence only approaches to substance abuse have any meaningful impact or any real outcome that will cause people to uh, reduce their substance use. Instead, by creating those all or none situations, what we ultimately find is if somebody can't stay clean entirely, then an abstinence only approach to substance use tells them that it's not worth trying to reduce their use at all. On the contrary, we know that somebody who might be shooting up four times a day, if they can shoot up twice a day, that's cut some of their risks of dying in half. That has cut the harm that they're doing to themselves in half. In half. So uh, more than anything else, we'll keep saying we're going to meet people where they are, but th this is a, a best practice that really is oriented around recognizing what's actually happening and not getting too caught up in what we wish was happening or what we think somebody should be doing differently. And this kind of ties to the, the question that came up before about trimorbidity. This chart, if you look, that before section, when we think about the entire universe of people without housing who use drugs or alcohol, there's an excellent research paper that came out back in 2008 by Chamberlain that looked at substance using homeless people. And what they found was absolutely incredible. It showed that of every person on the street who uses drugs and who uses drugs to the point where it's problematic, only one out of three of them had that problem before they became homeless. One out of three, so less than half, had major problems with substance abuse before becoming homeless. The rest of them picked up that problematic substance use after becoming homeless. And, and you see this every day, whether it's somebody who may not have been drinking much before suddenly is out living on the street and they're terrified. They're afraid they're going to be robbed or assaulted or shot or arrested and they can't fall asleep because there's sirens passing by or traffic passing by or yelling at all hours of the night. So they start drinking more to be able to sleep better. Is it the best possible choice that they could have made? No. But is it understandable in the context of who they are and what they're dealing with, and, and particularly with the ongoing traumas associated with homelessness? Absolutely. And there are numbers like this that point to um, mental health problems that may have existed prior to homelessness, but there is nothing like the experience of becoming homeless and enduring homelessness to exacerbate all of those problems. So things that might have been mildly problematic, that may have a, had a minimal disruption on somebody's functioning in a housing situation becomes something that is overwhelming and almost impossible to deal with without extensive supports in a homeless situation. So this again points to the need to not only get people off of the street, but to do it as quickly as possible because the longer we let somebody stay outside, the more difficult substance use might be, the bigger the gaps in employment history become, the more uh, significant mental health issues become. And 
once we get somebody into housing, that's how we move back to that point where even if there were co or pre-existing mental health issues, we get back to that minimally disruptive and still possible to function, but it only happens in a safe, secure place like somebody's own apartment. So harm reduction, more than anything else, accepts that drug use is a reality in the housed community, in the unhoused community. Uh, there are ways that drug use can be done that are less likely or to create problems, to lead to arrest, less likely to kill you. And, and I want to be really clear here that, that harm reduction doesn't mean we're going out and saying, hey, you're on meth. That's awesome. It doesn't condone drug use. It doesn't encourage drug use but it recognizes that if drug use is occurring, there's really not a whole lot of tisk tisk tisking or finger pointing or anything else that's going to stop somebody from using substances. So harm reduction looks at ways we can minimize the risks of these activities. So uh, some days that looks like distributing clean needles. Some days it looks like making sure that people you know to be opiate users have access to Narcan. Um, some days it looks like encouraging somebody to use test strips on heroin to make sure that there's no fentanyl in it, or making sure that if they are going to use drugs intravenously, they're going to do that with a buddy who is able to call for help if they have an overdose. Um, harm reduction looks at drug use uh, not as a black or white issue or as an all or none issue, but instead it looks at it on a continuum from people who are absolute teetotalers who don't use drugs or who have gone into some recovery program and, and complete and total abstinence works for them all the way up to severe, extremely problematic and sometimes lethal use. And when we are providing services through a harm reduction lens, we are not judging the fact that somebody is using drugs. We are not saying, if you quit using drugs, then I'll get you into housing. We are not trying to negotiate their drug use. We are simply trying to make it as safe as possible. Again, looking at the reality that when somebody moves into housing, it is not at all uncommon to see massive reductions in the number of uh, times of use during the day, number of uh, servings of alcohol during the day, anything like that, once we can build in that sort of bottom tier of the, the hierarchy of needs of safety and security and housing, then we can start to see progress. But it is often very difficult to see that when somebody is still out in a crisis setting on the street. Harm reduction um, activities and, and practices also really help us build rapport as well. Um, you will instantly. Um, build rapport with somebody when you give them um, a needle. All right, I'm gonna move on to just two quick best practices that I wanna share with you as other fundamental parts of street outreach before we take our first break. Um, we are, it looks like just about at the hour mark, maybe 50 minutes. So this should be about 10 more minutes and then we'll get a quick break going. So I wanna talk briefly about progressive engagement. Uh, progressive engagement basically just makes sure that we are giving people the right level of service. And that's the level of service that they need. We're gonna focus on that for one second, on the level of service that they need. That is different than the level of service that they want. Um, in the homeless world, there is an intervention known as permanent supportive housing. It is, as, as the name indicates, permanent. We will move you into housing. We will subsidize your rent for up to the rest of your life. And we will provide support services for up to the rest of your life. Everybody wants that. However, not everybody needs that. Not everybody is going to require that intense level of intervention. And in fact, we don't have enough resources to give this to everybody. So progressive engagement makes sure that we're providing people the right level of services for what their needs are. Think about it. If you walked into a hospital emergency room and you had a broken arm, it would be silly. It would be completely ineffective. It would be not cost effective. And it would be a waste of time to treat a person with a broken arm as if they were having a heart attack. It would bring out way too many doctors, way too many nurses, way too many resources for something that can be fixed more simply. So that's that's in many ways progressive engagement in action. There's this triage, and then we're making sure that people get the help that they need 
but not more than that. So when we're doing progressive engagement and this sort of happens organic, organically and naturally, uh, this comes from having rapport with people. It comes from um, some kind of triage tool or assessment so that we have a sense of who needs what. And we'll talk more about how we'll get to that point later. And to do this, you have to know the details of their lives. You have to know what it is they're trying to accomplish and how you might be able to help them get there. So when we're doing this, we it, it's about the relationship and it's rapport building is not a one-time thing. You know, Mark said, it's a great start to hand somebody a needle. That is a fantastic way. If they are an intravenous drug user and you know that this will help keep them more safe and there's eight people at the camp sharing the same needle, then it's going to make sense to provide that. But the, the rapport you build happens over many, many engagements and it happens from other agencies. It happens from other people on your team. Um, there's, there's no real value in a, a good cop, bad cop approach among outreach workers. And in fact, some of what you'll find when you first approach people is that they want nothing to do with you because they've been burned by many other agencies who promised they would help. So there is this collective notion to building rapport with people and a cumulative approach to building rapport. And you only have control over about 80% of that. And finally, I wanna just kind of briefly take you through motivational interviewing. This is a clinical practice. Um, motivational interviewing, to put it as simply as possible, is about finding the biggest motivation that somebody has and connecting it to the smallest possible step they can take to move forward. So how can we match that, that big motivation to the smallest step they can take to make progress? And once you kind of get good at this, how can we tie that to housing? Um, we have seen repeatedly people who will tell us, I don't want housing. I don't trust that you're gonna get me housing. I don't think you can help me. Three other people told me they'd help me and then they just judged me or shamed me. And so the hell with you, I don't want housing. I just want a motorcycle. Okay, so motivational interviewing is listening there and hearing what it is that they're telling you that they want. And then thinking about how can you tie that to the biggest possible step, the biggest possible motivation. So we want housing. They're not there yet. They want a motorcycle. Well, what's the common denominator there? You're going to need a license to drive a motorcycle. You're going to need a license or some other form of ID to sign a lease. So this is not necessarily the time where we say, hey, Mark, you want a motorcycle. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Call me back when you want housing. We're just going to flow with that. And we're going to say, okay. Well, that sounds great, man. Let's go ahead and get you this ID because you're going to need that to get your motorcycle registered. And, and even if you're doing that, you're still making tiny steps that will ultimately get them closer to housing. Eventually, they're going to get tired of people messing with their motorcycle. And you're going to be able to say, man, you know where a great place to park that motorcycle would be? Your own house. So maybe we can go from there and try to get you a little bit closer again. And basically just looking for opportunities to figure out what it is that somebody is trying to accomplish, whether that's reuniting with a family member, a child, um, reconnecting with parents, getting back uh, the job that they had lost years ago, anything like that. So we're going to ask open-ended questions. We're going to affirm what they have to say. We'll reflect back what we hear from them, and then we'll summarize that. So uh, reflective listening in the context of uh, motivational interviewing, and I think I skipped right over the open-ended questions. Um, open-ended questions are not, here's what we need to do to get you into housing. Open-ended questions start with, so tell me about your plan to get off of the street, or when you think of your perfect apartment, what does that look like? And then the affirmations from there, you know, somebody's going to say, I don't think I can do this. And you're going to highlight right away their strengths. You know what? You've already put three applications in. That is amazing. Or gosh, I can't imagine anybody else still going after all that you have dealt with. The very fact that you showed up today to talk to me is absolutely amazing. And we're just going to keep driving home 
those strengths because people without housing consistently repeatedly are reminded of their deficits in everything that they see and hear and do. So any opportunities we have to emphasize the sheer tenacity that it takes to get up and survive every day is an opportunity for us to connect with people out on the street. And when you hear people say, I don't know if I can do this, or I am not sure I want to do this, or I don't know if anything I've done has ever added up to anything, you can, you can reflect that right back. You know, you, you can say, look, I understand this is really frustrating. It sounds like you're exhausted. It sounds like this is one of the hardest things you have ever done. On the one hand, you've tried everything. And on the other hand, you still haven't given up. And how can we kind of get right into that spot to make sure that they haven't given up and that we are showing them the, the hope and the optimism that they may not be able to carry for themselves at this point. Sometimes it also really helps me as well to, to remember to affirm someone's resilience because living outside is not easy and it's admirable. Um, and, and folks need to be reminded of that because it's tough to survive and they're doing it. So that makes it really easy to affirm somebody if you just, just remember to admire their resilience. And then finally, you can take these opportunities to connect with people, to engage with people. Um, and then when you've asked these open-ended questions, when you've affirmed what it is they're working on or what they're doing, when you've reflected back to them what you're hearing, whether that's uncertainty or strength or hope or anything else, uh, you can summarize this and, and you can kind of come back to, you know, so I'm hearing you say you're really, really frustrated. I'm hearing you say you don't think you're ready for housing or you don't think you're ready to leave the, the lack of responsibilities you have right now or the lack of a schedule that you have right now. Um, but on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being completely ready, how ready do you think you are to get your own appointment, or your own apartment? And if they say the answer is a five, they say, okay, okay, that's a five. So what made you answer a five? You know, what made you answer a five instead of a three? What, what, let them tell you what they think those strengths are, what they think those things, those little shreds of hope that they can hang on to. Um, what made you answer a five and not something higher than that? Well, I don't know if I'd be able to get a job or I don't know if I'd be able to, you know, I don't know if my ex-wife would pick up the phone when we called or, you know, any of those things. And you're just curious here. You're, you're asking questions. You're trying to figure out what their biggest motivation is. And it's critical that we never assume that our motivations for them are the same as their motivations for them. But at the end of the day, if the, our motivation is housing and theirs is a motorcycle, that doesn't mean the work is done. It just means we've got to be curious and, and clever in how we move through this in a very genuine and supportive way. All right, so it is, well, our time, 1242. Uh, it's basically been about an hour. Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break to give everybody a chance to get up and stretch around. And we will start back at, oh God, I'm trying to do time zone math at 9.55 when you all, uh, in your time. So we'll see you at 9.55.
Thank you. 
All right. So overall, to get us back to this this place where we're understanding the big picture of street outreach, um, it's important to note and to, to consider what street outreach is. You know, it's it is a service that we provide. It's an intervention. And and to define that pretty clearly, it's an action to improve a situation by interfering in the affairs of another person. You're interfering in the current state of their homelessness. You know, you want to develop different kinds of approaches. You want to develop innovative ways to engage with people. And overall, more than anything else, we are not there waiting for people to change who they are or how they're showing up or what they're doing in order for them to be able to engage with us. It is on us to change what we do, how we do it, how we approach people to engage with the people who may or may not be interested in talking to us. So one of the terms that comes up pretty regularly, and I want to just kind of shut this down right now, is service resistant. Um, people are not service resistant. More often, the services we're offering are people resistant. So in, in you know, when we talked about emergency shelters, we would say for years that um, nobody wanted shelter because they must have wanted to be homeless and they don't want housing. They choose to be homeless. It turns out when we design our shelters in the right way, when we don't require um, ID or birth certificate or income or sobriety, a lot of people wanted shelters. Usually three or four times as many people wanted shelter as we previously had thought based on those old requirements. Uh, similarly with street outreach, if somebody's not engaging with you, it's on you to change how you're engaging with them instead of just you know shutting down the idea that they might want services from you. And how that starts is really creating a situation where people feel like you've got something to offer to them. Um, that can be your time, it can be the trust that they have in you. It can be tents, it can be toothbrushes, it can be solutions to their homelessness, it can be solutions to their problems. But overall, when somebody is unwilling or, or reluctant to engage with you, that is saying more about your attempt to engage with them than it is necessarily saying about um, what services they may or may not want. And overall, we are trying to get to a tipping point. So right now, the vast majority of people that you are seeing out on the street, the vast majority, if not all of them, have a peer group that is entirely unsheltered. So, so that is to say, the only other people they know are, are homeless people. They're, they're unsheltered folks. And the idea that housing is normal or possible or available isn't even at top of mind for them. So one of the things we'll be talking about today and kind of closing out is how do we get to that tipping point where uh, somebody that you're engaging with on the street knows more people in housing than they do unsheltered people. And it's going to take time as a community to get there, but we're aiming for this spot where people think that being in housing is more normal than being homeless. So from here, we wanna go into the three major types of engagements you're gonna end up having with people on the street, uh, starting with rapport building. And this is kind of developing a relationship, showing up and, you know, the, it, it sounds fancy to say we're, we're engaged in a rapport building engagement. Um, how are you getting to know this person? How are you laying out who you are and what you might have to offer? 
and uh, what they might be able to expect from you. So rapport building engagements are, are professional, but they're friendly. They're aimed at ultimately getting to the point of housing focused engagements. And, and the, the first step though, is getting to know that person. You know, again, I'm gonna go back to an emergency shelter example. We used to end up in a spot where we had um, people showing up for shelter intakes. And the first questions that people asked is, um, the first question that people were asked is the um, general list of intake questions. Hey, who are you? What's your name? What's wrong with you? What are your, you know, do you use drugs? Why did you get evicted? Tell me about all your health problems. And, you know, if we were to start a relationship like that, we wouldn't have a whole lot of friends. You know, if the first time you met somebody, you were just like, hey, man, tell me about the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And, oh gosh, I didn't get to take that note down. Could you repeat that? Do you use drugs? Is this something, you know, it, we would think that that was absolutely unreasonable, but that's how we tend to approach homeless services as well. So these engagements for rapport building are intended to get to know the person, to show them that you are somebody they can count on. And it can range from making sure if you see that they're hungry, getting them a bag lunch, um, bringing them a cup of coffee, if you hear a need that they express and it starts with, man, I've asked five different outreach workers for this and nobody's ever been able to help me with this, man, that's your in. How can you find a way to make that happen? Whether it's getting them a pair of pants, finding them a phone so you can connect with them, anything like that. So at this stage of the engagement process, you're not really trying to do anything other than make some minimal conversation, make some minimal commitments, and then follow through on those and show that you are a person who can be counted on. Telling jokes goes a long ways in this um, in this part of the process too. I mean, you you can bond with somebody almost instantaneously with uh, with some humor. Um, so. We should have put together a slide with our best jokes uh, that we could have could have done, but we'll leave that to you all. Hopefully there's some dads in the audience who, who have some terrible jokes that you can start with. But yes, humor is an excellent way to just connect with people, to build rapport um, and, and to go from there. So the next type of engagement that you'll come across is an emergency engagement. And these don't necessarily happen often, but when they happen, it's again, and you'll hear us say this probably a hundred more times today, it's about how can you show up and be somebody that they can count on. So um, with an emergency engagement, you're just trying to help them deal with an immediate crisis. It could be a domestic violence situation, some problem with their health, some, some overdose, um, somebody getting robbed, somebody getting arrested, kind of anything in the middle of that. And, and so you are looking for just, it's, this is kind of a one and done. How can we help solve this immediate crisis? We're not trying to solve the underlying trauma or the underlying poverty. We're not trying to solve the fact that they might use drugs to an, a level that creates ongoing problems for them. We're trying to solve this immediate issue. So sometimes this is, and, and a lot of this borrows from mental health first aid, Sometimes you're just connecting them with the appropriate agency, but it's not just giving them a number to a social services agency. It's staying there with them on the phone, getting past the receptionist, connecting them with the right person there. Uh, one of the things that you can flex as somebody who has some knowledge of the social service system in the community is knowing who to call, knowing when to call, knowing where to go. Um, if there are solutions for them at another agency, but they need a ride to get there, can you get them a Lyft or an Uber? Can you follow up to make sure that what the other agency said will happen has actually happened? So again, these are less frequent, but these are, you know, can you call 911 if, if there's something happening where they have a medical emergency? Can you solve this immediate issue and then circle back to come back and say, hey, this looked like something really, really rough was going on. How did the rest of that day go? Is there anything else that you need? And then finally, the, the, go ahead. All right, John. Um, at, at this stage, too, um, I, I have found it to be so helpful um, in, in building a, a, a longer term um, a professional relationship with somebody that's um, really focused on getting them into housing to show up if they're at the hospital um, or, or, or whatever, wherever it is that they need to go to resolve the emergency situation 
um, that's, yeah, that opens the door to so many conversations. Um, so yeah, there's another tip. And then the final kind of engagement and where we're going to spend the rest of our time really emphasizing is these are these housing focused engagements. So what ways can we show up and engage with somebody that will move them closer to housing? So these are objective based, they're purposeful, they involve activities that lead to housing, including the steps required to get into housing, and it involves creating a housing plan for them. So, so far we've covered the best practices, the ways of approaching. We have kind of a general overview of outreach and the types of engagements. So from here, we're gonna go into um, just one more brief uh, sort of typology of unsheltered outreach uh, potential uh, participants. And then from there, we're gonna go into exactly that, the housing plan, the, the steps towards housing and what that might look like. Before we do that though, this, is, uh, this all comes from an excellent book by Ian DeYoung called The Book on Ending Homelessness. And it ties back to a, a research project he had done in the mid 2000s, where rather than just assuming they knew everybody who was out on the street, they did daily censuses for, I wanna say 150 days out of the year. And what they found is not that the homeless population is static. It is not that we're dealing with the same people. You know, if you have 780 people unsheltered on the streets of Reno today, what this has shown us is that next month, you may still have 780 people on the street, but only 600 of them were the people who were there last month. And over the course of a year, you're gonna see basically three different kinds of people. So he splits them into tumbleweeds. And these are folks who kind of, float around from one place to another. You see them regularly in different places, but one day you see them in Virginia Street, the next day you see them over by the CARES campus, one day you see them over by a casino, one day you see them someplace else. Um, they are pretty skilled in connecting with services that are available in the daytime. Sometimes they're gonna use shelters. Uh, they're generally higher functioning. They're not your, your most severe and persistent in terms of mental illness or substance use. Uh, but this is roughly 20 to 30 percent of the people who are out on the street. Uh, compare that to the one and dones. And these are folks who can make up half of your unsheltered population. So these are people who are out on the street today and they may have become homeless or shown up in your unsheltered population for a number of reasons. These are the folks who maybe they had their services restricted at the shelter for one night. So you just found them laying out on the street one night, or they got into a fight with their partner and they got kicked out of the house, or it's a kid who got kicked out of his parents' house, or a college student who stumbled out of the bar drunk and fell asleep on a park bench and, you know, we'll be fine tomorrow. But up to half of the people that you're seeing on a daily basis are people that you're very likely never to see again. So let's let's keep that in mind. So right now we've talked about the one and dones. These are up to half, from a third to a half of the unsheltered population. The tumbleweeds are the folks who are kind of bouncing around and you'll see them in different areas, generally high functioning. That's another roughly, we'll call it a quarter of your population. And then anchors. These are the folks who tend to be the, when you think of a stereotype of who you're looking at for unsheltered homelessness, these are your guys. So they tend to be male. They tend to be age 50 or above. They're generally always really close to the same place. They have a spot, um, typically chronically homeless. They've been homeless for more than a year. They have multiple health problems. They have tried shelter at some point in their lives. It just didn't work for them. Um, and specifically, these folks thrive within homelessness. This is not, they are not choosing homelessness, but their survival skills, their existence has become oriented toward doing quite well being homeless. This can be through forming relationships with other people in the same neighborhood, in the same spot, forming relationships with bars and restaurants. And these are the guys, they're sweeping the floor in exchange for a cup of coffee, um, taking out the trash in exchange for a plate of food. They have gotten really good at being homeless uh, out of necessity, out of survival. So now that we see the homeless population 
today is not the same as the homeless population tomorrow. And the people that you might serve, it, based on what we just covered, there's a 50-50 a, a chance that the person you're talking to will never be seen again. So what does that mean for the use of time when you're out on the street as an outreach worker? So John, could I uh, interrupt quickly? Sure, please. Just because we have our team here um, to provide some context in our community. Are we seeing tumbleweeds, one and duds, or anchors primarily out and about? Anyone? Yeah. Anchors? Anchors? So, John, it sounds like what we're seeing um, primarily in the city of Reno um, fall into the anchors category. I so thought of Wild Bill when we were. <laughs> we have a very uh, well-known individual who goes by Wild Bill. And when you were going over that definition, that's who I thought of. Wonderful. So anchors. So anchors are, an outreach works best with anchors. Um, and it's, it's because we go where they are um, and we make ourselves a part of their existence. Um, and, and by doing that, um, you develop that relationship with them. And it takes time. I can't. I can't emphasize that it's not a quick process. Um, but hopefully, um, in the future, you can utilize that relationship to move somebody inside, um, and it it works. So, if you guys have a lot of anchors in your community, um, this is what you need. And and to really build on that, you know, that right there tells me that it is probably if, if if we we spend a lot of time in local government or in nonprofit circles talking about leadership, there's leadership among the homeless population. And it sounds like Wild Bill is one of your leaders and most likely to be in our community, it's a guy named Tiger. But it, you know, if getting Tiger housed was a game changer for so many other people that were kind of in his circle and you know, people would become, people would become homeless and it was a coin toss either they were gonna start working with service providers and outreach workers and start making steps towards housing, or they were gonna connect with Tiger who would help them get really, really good at being homeless. And once Tiger moved into housing, it changed the dynamic among so many other people. So it may make sense to kind of prioritize some resources and some time to find who those people are in your community in order to start working with them most directly as well. And so knowing that you're seeing anchors, and, and I would argue, you know, if your team is focused primarily on the downtown area and those are those anchor spots, then that may make that makes a lot of sense that those are who you're primarily seeing. Over the course of a day, however, there are people showing up in other parts of the community or over in Sparks or elsewhere so that they are still people who are kind of fluttering through one piece of the service matrix or another. Um, and that kind of points to this use of time matrix that shows, you know, if you're a new outreach worker, 70% of your time is locating new people to serve. Um, but by the time you're an experienced outreach worker, you're spending just a fraction of your time because you've already determined who those anchors are. And it sounds like you may have a little bit of a head start on that. Um, but you don't want, what you don't want is to start engaging fully with everybody until you have seen them multiple times. And you want to make sure that the work and the effort you're going to put into this is going to be valuable because they will be there again the next time you see them and the next time. So there's no magic number. And if these are people who you've seen for years on the street, well, then you can start engaging with them right away. But if you're coming into contact with somebody for the first time, then it makes sense to just be, you know, bring some coffee, have a pouch of tobacco, have a, a card with some services and a sleeping bag that you can offer, and just make sure you're engaging until you get to the point where you're certain that they're gonna be around for a while. Um, overall, you, you'll you see just basically the, the continuum here is if you're new, you're spending most of your time meeting people and that transitions over to when you're experienced, you're very rarely meeting new people. Instead, you're seeking out the people who you are trying to consistently engage with to get them closer to housing. I've found also with, with our team of seven people, it's good to have 
um, a majority of your folks um, in the, the experience um, category, but to always have somebody new that's kind of coming in um, because it does open the door to sometimes those folks that um, that you miss because you just get used to seeing them. So let's switch over to what the actual steps are and what it's actually going to take to, to bring it home, to get somebody who is living unsheltered in Reno from homeless into housing. And we've broken this into five key parts. We're talking about that initial rapport building, which is separate and distinct from your initial housing engagement. Once you've had those initial housing engagements with somebody and you've determined that this is a, a time when they're ready and looking forward to not being homeless any longer, then you're gonna move into this cycle of trying to make progress towards housing. Eventually, we're gonna exit them from the program for a number of different reasons, and then following up to make sure that they're staying stably housed from that point forward. So starting with the rapport building, um, I, I've probably said this 10 times today, and I'm gonna say it 10 more times, you are trying to show that you are somebody they can count on. People who live unsheltered, people who have been um, rejected by shelters, people who have decided that shelters are not going to work for them, have had, you're not the first social agency that they have engaged with. What you're trying to show is that you're the first one that they can trust. So this in, involves, first of all, not walking up and saying, hey, man, I'm going to get you housed by Friday when we know that's not true. You might not even have this guy telling you his name by Friday. Um, but it starts with kind of building a relationship. And sometimes that's bringing toiletries. Sometimes that's bringing sleeping bags. Sometimes that's saying, oh, my goodness, I can't believe you had that experience. That sounds so frustrating. Can I get you a cup of coffee? And you can tell me more about it. Um, Whatever you do, whatever you commit to, at this point, it is critical that you follow through. If you can't follow through, it is critical that you show up when you said you would and explain why you couldn't follow through. You know, whatever it is, is built around demonstrating that you are somebody that they can trust. Um, in terms of data, it, I'll give a quick overview of, of the HMIS or the Homeless Management Information System. In your community, there is a centralized database that is used to collect information um, at this point, just on demographics of people who are out on the street. Um, ultimately, you'll be tracking who they are, what their name is, you know, their data, their date of birth, their social security number, all the things that were required to report for grant funding and everything else, whether they're white, whether they're male, female, trans, whether they are um, a veteran, whether they have a disability, whether they have income. But at this point, you are just collecting enough to have a record where you can kind of capture other information on services provided. This doesn't require a case plan. In fact, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be talking to people and then typing in a case note while you're doing it. That's pretty bad form in terms of building that genuine trust with somebody. So phase one is just rapport building, pure and simple, and demonstrating that you are somebody who can be trusted. Now- I have that too. So sometimes yeah. I've, I've had before, um, I've, I've met somebody and all I've gotten was their first name, like um, um, John, and then um, I'll, I'll put a, an entry in HMIS just to get it started so that I can keep track of the person. And so I know who they are. I'll just put John Big Beard for last name. And that's the beginning of it. And then as you see that person more and more, your uh, HMIS profile evolves into um, a complete profile. It just takes time. So moving on um, to this just rapport building in general, to sum it up, what do we do here? We provide basic needs. We provide things to help people survive. We reflect back their feelings or their experiences and we show up. But to move any, and, and you may hover in the rapport building stage for minutes. You may hover in the rapport building stage for years. And there is no right or wrong timeline. There is no, this person will succeed if we get to housing within 20 minutes or within two months. It's going to be done at their own, on their own timeframe. But once we can get 
a little bit further. And here's some of the ways that we use to kind of get into just gauging interest here. Um, it's a fair question to say, have you ever thought about getting off the streets? Um, what would it look like for you? What would, you know, if you were going to get off the streets, what would your ideal apartment look like? You know, is it that it's way out in the, in the country, far away from everybody? Is it that you're right in the middle of downtown next to some other social services where your friends are still receiving services? Is it that you need a place with a yard because it, you've got a dog and that dog's going to come with you everywhere you are? Um, and then what have you tried before? You know, and, and here you'll be amazed at what people disclose. Uh, you'll hear quite often, well, I had a place through the VA and I got kicked out because I got into a fight with the landlord or I got kicked out because of this. Well, you're still eligible for those housing programs. Um, I had a voucher or back when I had my social security money coming in, I was able to afford rent at this hotel or at this place or at this place. And you're listening there for kind of a tip of the cards. What else might you now realize are past or potential future resources? So this initial housing engagement really starts with having that conversation about housing and taking steps toward housing. At this point, you're gonna create a little bit more robust of an HMIS profile, but this is again on a continuum. As Mark said, it's never going to need to be absolutely complete or incomplete. Um, it's also very important at this point that you get them to sign a release of information. Um, you need to protect and preserve. This is part of building trust um, that they can count on you. And that includes counting on you not to go spreading their business all over town. Even with other outreach workers, unless what you're sharing with another outreach worker will move this person closer to housing or to connection with another agency, there's really no reason for you to be sharing that information. And at this point, you're going to um, create an entry into whatever HMIS uh, program you use, whether that's one for the clean and safe team or there's another community-wide outreach uh, program. And that's going to allow you to kind of catalog all the other things that you're learning, all the other information and all the other steps that you're going to take. So at this stage of the workflow, you would begin to do an assessment as required for coordinated entry uh, in your community that is still at this point, the VI SPDAT. If you're not familiar with that, it stands for the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. Uh, basically, it's a triage tool. It tells you that this person would be most appropriate to put into what kind of program is that permanent supportive housing, is that rapid rehousing, or is, them, is that helping them uh, resolve their homelessness on their own? That is the first step to get somebody placed on the coordinated entry list. And uh, I'm gonna do a, just a brief overview of that coordinated entry process for those of you who are not familiar with it in just a minute. Uh, at this point, you're also starting to work with them to get the documents ready. So you're thinking about it you know, you'll see this again when we talk about income, you're acting as if they're already on the way into housing in some ways, because in order to sign a lease, you're going to need an ID. You're probably going to need a birth certificate or a social security card to sign up for other benefits. So we don't even have to have an apartment on the horizon or the potential of moving into housing there yet. We can always be doing these things to make sure that when that time comes, that's not when you start doing that. And suddenly it can take two, three months to get a birth certificate. It can take a long time to get a social security card sometimes. Uh, and that's when things go well and there are no hiccups in the process. So the more things we can do preemptively, you're supporting not only yourself, you're supporting the entire outreach team because somebody else may be able to place this person into housing. You're supporting the entire continuum of care because they may be placed into another agency's permanent supportive housing, but all of that stems from their ability to actually sign the lease. You'll be entering your basic contacts into HMIS. I saw John Bigbeard on Tuesday. We talked about this. I provided basic needs. I provided toiletries. 
and then you're going to start a case plan for housing focused services. Um, and I'm going to hand this next one over to Mark to talk a little bit more about what that housing plan looks like and, and the way you go about presenting that to somebody as you're working with them. So the, the difference between um, street outreach and traditional case management is in a traditional case management, you have a concrete case plan, um, usually written down, um, usually uh, on a one piece of paper with a goal, objective, you know, did you achieve it, right? The reason that ours is different is because we have one goal and that's housing. We're always trying to move people to housing. So the way that we go about that is we start off, we identify what resources they are that already exist for that person. As John mentioned earlier, those are their, the strengths that they might have or also the barriers that they might have for moving into housing, like in a, a rental history, like an eviction makes it difficult or criminal history sometimes makes it difficult. Um, there's all, all sorts of barriers that can be there and then we help them scale those barriers or try to locate housing that will accept them regardless of those barriers. Um, first step always is diversion. If we meet somebody who has not entered the, uh, the homeless system, um, then we engage in a conversation with them to find out what resources they have. Say we find out that they have a mom who lives in Alabama that would be willing to, um, to take them in. First thing we do is we call the mom and we ask them if that's something that they'd be willing to do. And then we purchase them a bus ticket and we diverted them. Um, they are now housed, um, total success. So we went from, from zero to the end of the case plan, which is permanent supportive housing. Uh, or I'm sorry, which is permanent housing, permanent supportive housing is a, a, a program. Um, also, specific resources in your community. Um, there might be voucher programs out there that are specific to Reno. Um, there's also PSH and rapid rehousing um, through the coordinated entry process. So the importance there is to get the VI SPDAT and get them document ready. In our community, the agencies that um, take permanent supportive housing persons and rapid rehousing persons require them to have an ID, a social security card, and a birth certificate. So that's the first thing that we always do, and that's standard on our case plan. So the main thing to remember, though, is case plan always ends with housing. That's it, John. All right. And, you know, as far as those diversions go, diversions, basically, it's kind of a on one hand, it's a very specific intervention. On the other hand, it's a bit of a catch-all term of how can we divert somebody from coming into the emergency shelter? How can we prevent them from even ever needing to enter a shelter system? Or how can we get them out of town with verification? This is not Greyhound therapy. It always involves, hey, you said you had a brother in California. Let's call that brother and make sure this is okay. But, you know, Mark mentioned in the first seven months, um, our outreach team housed 88 people. In the first 10 months, that had grown to 118 people. About one out of every four of those were diversions. That means it didn't require a housing resource that was part of the emergency homeless assistance system. It involved connecting them with friends or family most often. And I, I want to say our team has pulled off diversions in 27 minutes, 30 minutes sometimes where somebody says, I've got this person, I just don't know how to get in touch with them, or I don't have a phone. We've come into contact with people who have income, they have veterans benefits, they're getting th uh, over $1,000 a month. And there are some places that they can afford with that. How can we connect them to it? You know, don't ever forget the, the homeless services system for all of the, the great parts about it can be a very frustrating navigating a very frustrating maze to navigate through. And if we can leverage some of our expertise in that or experience in just helping somebody cut through the red tape or jump through a hoop that they didn't even know existed, there are some low hanging fruit out there where, you know, if you're looking at 25% of a of an unsheltered population of 800, it's not unreasonable to think that you could get 200 people within a year moved into another living environment that isn't even in Reno. So that's something to always remember as you're keeping your options open. And um, we can, I don't know that we'll have time today, but happy to, to come back if it's helpful to kind of give a quick overview of 
how to, to deliver a diversion when you're actually out on the street. Well, and to add on to that as well, um, that's the key that the, what John just mentioned is being out on the street and being there. Um, because the reason diversions happen is because we have outreach workers on the street. If they weren't there, then it wouldn't happen. Um, so that's the beauty of outreach. You are there. Um, and when somebody's ready to, to go, you help them go and it's done. All right. So making progress towards housing is maintaining contact. It's being consistent. It is being out there. As Mark said, it is showing up and, and engaging with people on their terms, helping with communication. You may know the number to call, or you may know the person at the housing authority who actually answers the phone when you call or when they go to lunch and how to get in touch with them and what they need to hear. Help with that, facilitate that. Helping with communication also means how can you get this person a cell phone? You know, if you are going to be working with them and they're going to be contacting landlords or looking for employment or waiting for a call from an agency to say, good news, your name has come up, we are going to house you, that's going to be a lot easier if you can get them a $25 a month burner phone to keep in their pocket so that anybody can get in touch with them as needed. And then finally, advocating at the coordinated entry level is a, a very, very important part of this. So when we are working with coordinated entry, um, coordinated entry is in essence a, a system that was designed to fix the problems with the homeless service system. The old model was that if you wanted help at, um, if you wanted help with housing, you would have had to go to the CARES campus, you would have had to go to our place, you would have had to go to the gospel rescue mission, you would have had to gone to the record street shelter, you would have had to gone to each different place, told your story a separate time, and waited and hoped that one of them would have a housing resource for you. Coordinated entry basically creates a no wrong door approach so that you can go and ask for help at one place and street outreach can be one of those places. And then your name goes up into what's called the by name list. It is a single list of unsheltered or, or unhoused people who are all kind of ranked according to who the most vulnerable person is. The good news is that many of the people that you will be working with are going to skyrocket to the top of that most vulnerable list if only we get them connected with it. Uh, on average, we, we find that, you know, most people are connected with coordinated entry or have been at some point in the past, but if nobody has seen them in 90 days, their name gets removed from the list. So if you are going out and talking to them, you create that contact and the person who's running that list will say, oh, an outreach worker has seen them. They are still homeless. They're still in our community. So keeping them at top of mind for that list is a key part of advocating for them. And the way, the way to do that is in, in HMIS, you need to enter a service for the person. Um, so that, and there are um, just generic street outreach services. Um, and a service can be just saying hello, because um, you now know where that person's at if their name does come up. Right. And, and how do we advocate for somebody at that level? You know, when sometimes it involves just showing up to the coordinated entry meetings and there in your community, chronic homelessness is the priority. So people who have been out on the street for more than a year, who have some kind of health problems, a disability, uh, and, are, and are typically a single adult will be prioritized to begin with, if only we can keep them there. Um, here is where you'll see some bits of progressive engagement come in because all things being equal, somebody who scores a very high score on the assessment um, in the shelter is probably very much less likely to die than somebody who has scored that same score, but they're living unsheltered out on the street. So you wanna be there just pushing and helping make sure that nobody has forgotten that this person is vulnerable and at risk on the street. And, and sometimes that's as simple as being the one who shows up to say, I believe this person will die on the street if we don't get them off of the street more quickly. Other times it's just making sure you're making your rounds and entering a service so that they're not removed from that list. 
I also find it helpful when you show up to advocate for a person um, that, that you think is at risk of dying, um, also to have in your back pocket um, key characteristics such as uh, trimorbidity. Um, that's something that, that we need to bring up, whether or not they're chronically homeless, how long they've been homeless is a good idea when you're advocating for somebody. And then also their age. If they're over the age of 60, then um, chances of them having negative health outcomes is greater when they're on the streets. So, but ultimately it's who's going to die first. Let's move that person inside. Yeah. And, you know, another big piece of that is those assessments. Um, they can be redone every six months. So, you know, an assessment, the, the VI SPADAT asks questions ranging from how long have you been homeless to are there any things that you're currently doing for money that you wish you weren't doing? Is there anybody who thinks you owe them money? How many times have you been to the emergency room in the past six months? How many times have you had contact with police in the last six months? So, it could be that in this, the span of a year, somebody is in a wildly different place in November than they were in January. So you can redo that assessment to make sure their score is valid and is going to help connect them with the right housing resource. Um, and then the other key piece of this at that coordinated entry level is, uh, I, I wish this wasn't the case, but there is no shortage of lazy social workers in our world. And I hate that that is the case. But we see all the time, you know, a, 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 an individual is assigned to an agency for housing and that caseworker drives down the street and says, well, I told this person to meet me here at noon and I didn't see them. They must not want housing. We can get involved in the middle to say, OK, this program is looking for this person. He is always here. He always buys his cigarettes here. He always talks to people at lunch at this shelter. How can we help them make it as simple as possible for this person to be there when they get there? Additionally, to add on to that too, um, a warm handoff is essential. So um, not only finding that person and making sure that they are aware that this person is right down the street, there's been times where um, I've taken people to um, social workers' offices and said, this is who you're looking for. And we sat in front of the social worker and, um, and the, they were entered into a housing program. Absolutely. Okay, so just a couple other pieces of this housing progress component of it. Um, Mark, I'll hand it off to you for the connecting with mainstream resources piece. Sure. So the first thing I should note here is in every community, there's their own um, very specific community-based resources. And, and I won't know what, um, what your resources are, but make sure that you do. Um, that's the essential part. Um, so the first thing we do in, in our discussions is, once again, we're always working towards housing, right? So, but in order to get somebody to that point, we need to make sure that they stay alive long enough to get to that point, make sure that they have food, as shelter as best as they can, the basic needs of survival, right? And so contacting and ensuring that a person has access to mainstream services that already exist is essential. First thing is access to food. So help them apply for SNAP benefits, for EBT, food stamps, any state programs that might exist in Nevada. Um, make sure that they have access to utility assistance programs if they if they exist where you're at. Um, and also, um, if they have any past due utilities, try and help them get that stuff covered as well. Make sure that they have access to health care if possible. Um, sometimes that can be kind of hard depending on whether or not your state took the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act expansion. Um, and then any other benefits that they might be entitled to, like unemployment benefits, entitlements, or maybe there's a pension out there somewhere, um, or or a, a widower's benefit or something to that effect. So um, mainstream services that already exist, make sure they have access to everything they're entitled to. Um, strategies to increase some income are Check to see, know your um, uh, rules for uh, disability, for SSI and SSDI. Um, know how to get a person access to those, um, have a relationship with somebody in the local social security office, the local TANF office, temporary assistance for needy families, and also at the VA. Um, so that once again, someone gets access to the services that they might be entitled to that already exist. And it makes it a heck of a lot easier to house them 
if they have access to a resource or a strength like we spoke about earlier. Um, also employment is, is um, very beneficial. So it is housing focused, like I mentioned early on, to get a person a pair of pants for a job interview, because that interview is going to increase their employment if they get the job, and that's going to help us move them into housing or find a unit that they can afford. The, the final piece of this, I think, is really important. We talked about this a little bit with document readiness and, and acting as if they were already on their way to housing. Let's act as if they already have income. I mean, in so many ways, moving somebody into housing is a, is a project management chart where, you know, this thing has to happen before this thing can happen. And then for this to happen, that's contingent upon this happening. But there are so many things we can do that will prevent, that will shorten the amount of time somebody's on the street. So if we waited until they were assigned to a housing program to start the ID or birth certificate or social security card process, we're three months behind from the get-go. Um, the housing search can take a long time. If, if somebody is trying to find something that meets their needs and is affordable, we all know in Reno, especially there, that there is an affordable housing crisis. There's an affordable housing crisis everywhere, but we can be having them think about what kind of place they might want to move into. Is it, is it this one complex because they already have a couple of friends there? Well, let's figure out what the requirements are to get them in there. Uh, so let's be looking for apartments. Let's be looking for a place that matches, you know, whatever transportation they have available. If it's none, or if it's a bus route, or if it's a bicycle that would let them get to the job that they have or the job that they're going to get. So it's just very important to understand that not everything has to happen sequentially. There are some things with that end goal of housing in mind that you can be building up and preparing for before the trigger is actually pulled to, to have income or to have housing. So then moving into the exit from the program. And of course, the preferred exit from a street outreach program is that we want somebody moving into permanent housing. So when we're talking about this, we want to talk about not only, you know, did we get them into housing? Because yes, that's absolutely important. But how are we making that house a home? Are, are we moving them into an empty apartment? with nothing on the walls and no furniture and, and you know no mattress or anything like that? Or have we lined up furniture? Have we lined up a trip to a thrift store to get basic household items? Uh, what kind of follow-up care is going to be needed? Do they have, you know, you'll see very often people survive on the street because they have five other people watching out for them. People to help them when they fall out of their wheelchair. People who help them remember to take their medication. And if you, you need to be aware of that, if you're suddenly saying, we will consider this person to have succeeded when we've isolated them and moved them into their own unit. So is somebody on the street a caretaker for them? And could they be a potential roommate? Does that cut their living expenses in half? Um, do they need follow-up care? You know, when you get into a rapid rehousing program or a permanent supportive housing program, there is some built-in support that could range from somebody visiting three times a week to somebody calling and checking in on the phone once a month. But what can we do to make sure that we're not just moving this person in? And what we have seen anecdotally is if you move somebody into an empty apartment and all they have is a folding chair, it's really easy for them to say, you know what? This isn't that much to lose. I'm just gonna leave and I'm not gonna pay rent or I'm not gonna do this or this. The more we can do to make that house feel like a home, ranging from furniture, stocking their pantry, making sure they have silverware, all the way through uh, introducing them to other people who may be in the neighborhood, showing them where the library is or how they get to the bus stop. You know, the more it feels like a place that belongs to them, the more they feel like it would be an issue if they lost this. So we want to really emphasize those things that make this a place of comfort and safety and security for them. It goes a long way if you make somebody cookies in their house or popcorn, it smells really nice and it reminds people of home. Absolutely. In some of our housing programs, when somebody moves in, the first thing the case managers do is they give this person an empty picture frame and they ask them to fill that frame with something that makes them happy. 
And so for some people, they, they put artwork that a friend has made. For some people, it's a family photo. But then you get that up on the wall immediately. And it's such a tiny thing. It's a $1.50 frame from, from the dollar store, you know. But the impact of that as being a piece of a home goes and carries on for weeks and months after moving. So the final piece of how else can we exit the program? So the direct housing placement is certainly an ideal, as is placement through coordinated entry, which has some built-in supports. If somebody is being exited from the program, then they can be diverted or reuni reunited with their family. That would be an exit from the program. An exit from the program in street outreach basically means you no longer expect to see them as a part of the unsheltered population in your community. Uh, in Reno, the no contact for 90 days is enough to get them removed from the coordinated entry list and to get them taken out of a program. Or if somebody dies, you're going to exit them from the program. But this does a couple of things. One, by maintaining the contact log that you have in the computer system for HMIS, you're making sure that they stay visible to the coordinated entry folks. Um, but by removing people who you've had no contact with, it makes sure that um, you have an accurate roster of who you would expect to see on the street, which is a way you can track program success. Uh, it also ensures that you are only working with people who are active and people who are in the community and the ones who are still able to be engaged for housing. So these are what your different outreach program exits will look like. And the other one, of course, is an entry into shelter. At that point, they are still in the homeless service system, but they are not somebody that outreach would be working with. And if they go into the shelter and they come back out on the street, you would just create a new entry to, to put them back in the program. Important to emphasize here too that you can always create a new one. Um, it, it never ends. All right, and finally, the follow up component. Once we move people in, our work is not quite done. We want to make sure that we're not just moving somebody in for a month and we pay first month's rent and last month's rent and security deposit. And as soon as those are expended, the person gets kicked out. So we want to make sure that we're following up at the 90 day mark, the three month mark, the six month mark and the 12 month mark. You can do this with calls either to the person, if you can still get in touch with them or to the landlord to ask, hey, is, you know, John Bigbeard in unit 3C still in housing? Um, or you can stop by the apartment as appropriate. And, and to some extent, depending on the relationship you have with people, you know, we have some people we move in who say, thank you so much. I, anytime you want to stop by, we'd love to see you. We have other people who say, thanks so much. I never want to see you again. And you want to just kind of play that out based on what is best for them. And then you want to coordinate with other services. So if somebody is moved in and they needed help with medical care, maybe there's a way that you can connect them with some support through Medicare. Maybe there's a way you can connect them with a medical outreach team. Maybe there's a way you can connect them with um, a place that gives rides to people with disabilities to get to medical appointments. But you wanna make sure that it's not just, you're off the street, you're no longer my problem. You have to understand that Housing first is great, but there are still other appropriate follow-up services that we need. And then tracking success to know if you, uh, if, if it turns out that everybody of this particular type you've moved in gets booted out within 90 days, you need to look at that and figure out what's working and what's not working. Overall, what we have found over decades of doing this is that people without housing generally want the same things that we do. They want to feel safe. They want to know that their stuff is safe. They want to know that their things will be there when they return home. Uh, whether that home at the time is a campsite or a spot on the street or an apartment. So we want to make sure we're giving people choices on what apartments they move into. Um, we hear often, I don't want to move into this neighborhood because I used to do drugs there and I know everybody there and the things I was involved with there is not who I am today. I'm not interested in going back there. That is not choosing to be homeless. That is not 
refusing housing that is advocating for somebody advocating for themselves trying to get the best situation they can now there are limits to this of course the reality of affordable housing is that you will probably be working with the same four or five or ten complexes before you um, can open up other choices so people will still end up in the same neighborhoods very often um, people can say i don't want to live here but i would live here they can say actually moving me onto the third floor is not going to work i have a wheelchair or a walker and the elevator hardly ever works at this place so we want to make sure we're listening and meeting the needs of the people we're moving into housing and not just forcing them into the only option while remembering that people do have the right to say this housing is not going to work for me. You know, a lot of that is rooted in this old social services idea that thankfully I think we've moved past that you should be grateful for this because it's better than nothing. And in many cases, what we find is that no, it's not better than nothing. We just haven't figured out the right thing to offer. So we're coming up on the end of the time. I just wanna move through the safety protocols and then we'll wrap up to get into the final pieces of this and have some times for question and answers. Um, safety protocols, all of this boils down in a nutshell to be respectful, be polite to people, respect people's space and their property um, and never feel like it's not okay to leave a situation where you don't feel safe. Um, you know, if you're approaching somebody, whether that's their own, whether that's a house or it's a tent or a, a, an alleyway, you want to call out who you are and why you're there and ask if it's okay if you approach. And if they say no, then try again the next day. Uh, maybe the next day you say, hey, I've got a cup of coffee here. Would you mind if I came up and shared it with you? But you can find ways, but you're only approaching upon invitation. Likewise, you know, you want to treat somebody's tent like it's their front yard or their front door. You would never be okay with somebody walking up to your house, opening your door and sticking their head inside to call in and see if you were home. We need to extend that same courtesy to people's homes, whether that's a traditional structure or a tent. So we want to be asking if we can approach. We want to say, hey, is anybody home? Do you mind if I come closer? And, you know, kind of do the equivalent of knocking on a door with somebody. Um, when you are knocking on doors, position yourself to the side. When you meet new people, make sure you're at a safe distance, make sure you know your exits where you see that if something goes wrong, I can go to the left or I can go to the right. You don't really want to end up in a confined space with somebody while you're out on the street, particularly people that you're meeting for the first time. In terms of professional boundaries, you want to tell people who you are and why you're there. You want to give people an understanding of what benefit they might get from meeting you. So when you introduce yourself, you're going to say, hi, my name is John. Uh, I'm an outreach worker. And I would love to talk to you about some services that we might be able to offer you that, that might help you get out of homelessness. You should always be able to identify yourself. I don't know if you've heard this one before, but be trustworthy and follow through. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Uh, at the same time, you want to main maintain your own personal boundaries. You don't want to give out your personal cell phone number. You don't want to discuss personal matters, whether that's about coworkers or about, you know, another person who you're serving. Uh, you never want to have weapons on you and you never want weapons in your vehicle. And then you're also maintaining professional boundaries by sometimes not answering your phone after work hours or some, unless somebody has been um, is going to reach out to you and it's somebody you're already working with, it, it, just because you've engaged with somebody once does not necessarily mean you need to solve every problem for them as those problems arise. You can still do that within the day-to-day the -day work that you're doing with them. It does not mean that you're perhaps obligated to answer their phone calls at 2 a.m., and then from there, you know, rush out to take them to the hospital. You can suggest that they call an ambulance. You could offer to call an ambulance, but you want to make sure that you're developing professional boundaries and, and really putting some guardrails around when you are working and when you are sort of home and doing something separate from work. Because these boundaries can bleed very, very quickly and they can get very hard to tell the difference of what is your uptime and what is your downtime. 
general safety, coordinate with your team all the time. Uh, make sure you, people know your calendar. Make sure that they know that you're going to be in this area from 10 to 11 a.m. Make sure that they know you're expected to be back in the office by 2 p.m. Uh, wherever possible. You want to be using a buddy system. You want to go out in pairs. And you always want to stay in contact with and in sight of your partner. So that doesn't necessarily mean you're standing right next to each other. But if you're both at the same camp, you should at least be able to have your eyes on each other and, and be able to signal to each other if you need each other's help. Make sure your supervisor knows where you are and knows if something's taking you longer than necessary. And if anything pops up, then let your supervisor know about that immediately. Mark and I were involved in work at a camp that was called the fire station camp. And we would have instances where one of our outreach workers said, gosh, you know, I've engaged with this guy five times, but something about what happened today led him to get really paranoid. And he kind of postured at me and approached me aggressively. And so they let Mark know, Mark let me know, we kind of came up with a plan that they wouldn't work with that guy directly there anymore. They would only meet with him on the sidewalk. He didn't want them to approach the tent. And so it was something that was easy enough to solve, but your team needs to be aware of this, both for their own safety. If they're going to be going back out there, you don't want him to say, I told you never to send somebody out here again, but you know, you want to be able to share everything that would help keep you and your other teammates safe. We eventually re-engaged with him as well, and he is now housed. I love that story. All right. A couple more general safety protocols. If there's been violence, you can tell when you walk into a camp, if there's just been a fist fight, you can almost smell it in the air. Um, you can tell if there is somebody who is hiding from somebody else. You want to always be aware of what's been going on there. This will come from the rapport that you have with people. You want to be aware of your surroundings. Never be afraid to leave. You can make whatever excuse you need. Hey, I'm, it's so nice to see you. I forgot. I have an appointment. I'm late for. I need to leave right now. Get on the phone. Call your supervisor. Walk away. But if something feels off, if you feel like you are not welcome there, then leave. If you feel like your spidey senses say, I should not be here then leave. Any of that is absolutely appropriate. There's no martyr complex associated with being a street outreach worker. And uh, it comes right back to boundaries. The problems that exist in camps, the problems that exist on the street existed before you, and they will exist after you. It is not in your power or something you are even necessarily capable of solving. So this is just your general invitation to know that you always have an out and there's never a time when you should be walking into a situation feeling like it's going to be really sketchy and keep moving in that direction. You can always ask somebody to meet with you a little bit further away. You can always come back with a partner. You can come back in the daylight hours as opposed to the nighttime hours, or you can come earlier in the morning when people are likely to be asleep or people are likely to be more sober or anything like that. So just keep that in mind. Um, if there are disputes between two people, it's not really on you to actually solve the problem between those two people. You can offer to get involved in some way by bringing one person over to you and talking to them separately. And you know, you can offer, say, hey, do you need me to contact law enforcement? Do you need me to contact uh, the paramedics? Do you need me to contact somebody else? I'd be happy to do that for you. But it's not on you to figure out if Joe actually stole Timmy's can of beans or if Timmy actually lent it to Joe because those kinds of things pop up and it, it's not in your purview and your wheelhouse to solve that. Um, and then when you can use verbal de-escalation de and disengagement techniques. So um, we'll talk about those in just one second, but basically you don't ever want to position yourself between two people who are posturing up to fight. You don't ever want to position yourself in a way where you are the sole arbiter of a dispute. And finally, just to wrap up, last things you can do safety-wise, trust your intuition. Again, if you got to leave, leave. It's fine. You can come back another day. Um, you could even use that as an engagement strategy. Hey, I noticed the last three or four times that I've come here, there have been people fighting. What is that like for you? Is that really hard to deal with? Have you ever thought about 
getting out of here or moving into some place where you didn't have to worry about any other people. You can always somehow tie it back to housing. Hey, that guy is raising, you know, that you hate that you live in this camp and this guy's always waking you up at seven in the morning with his radio. You know where you don't have to worry about that guy? In your own apartment. You know where you don't have to worry about people snoring all night long? In your own apartment. How can we connect that back to housing? Uh, of course, always have a phone, always have it charged at all times and take care of yourself. We often overlook this and we fall into this kind of martyr complex of how, how, who am I to do this good thing for myself when so many other people are suffering? But if you can show up recharged and refreshed, you will be able to do so much more with people than if you show up haggard and exhausted and burnt out all of the time. Couple quick notes and conflict de-escalation. Never in the history of calming down has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down. There is no faster way to escalate a conflict than to tell the other person they need to be more calm. So what else can we do? Uh, conflict de-escalation starts with rapport building. When we train our shelter staff, we tell people that 90% of conflicts are de-escalated before they even start simply by us being able to walk up and say, Mark, it looks like you're having a really hard time right now. I know we've talked about some of this recently. Can we just take a walk? I'd love to be able to keep working with you, but uh, I, I need to be able to talk to you over here. I can't hear. There's so much yelling going on or anything like that. So building that rapport with people is a great start to making sure conflicts don't happen. When a conflict does happen, thinking back to what we learned about trauma-informed care, it has nothing to do with you. Even if they say it's all your fault, it's everything about you, it is not about you. How people react is based on their experience and their past experiences, not about you. Now that said, how you respond is going to determine how they continue to respond. So a great tactic here, somebody comes up at you yelling at the top of their lungs all the way, you're gonna keep a calm, soft voice. You're gonna keep a voice where you're clearly talking to them, but they're so loud that they can't even hear you. Nine times out of 10, they are going to match your volume. They will lower their intensity to match your intensity. Now that said, somebody starts raising their voice and you start raising your voice to yell at them to calm down, they're gonna keep matching your intensity that way as well. So the more we can do to just determine the outcome by keeping it soft and simple and clearly communicating, the easier it is to deescalate a conflict. And remember that everything somebody is doing is more about them and their past traumatic experiences. People have learned through a series of traumatic events that in order to get what they want, they have to get loud. In order to get their needs met, they have to be aggressive. In order to do anything, they must respond or behave in a certain way. So when somebody is escalated, remember, it's not about you. Remember that you have some influence on the tone from that point forward by setting a lower tone, and you get to decide if we take it personally. You get to decide if you decide it's about you, and it never is. So whatever they're saying, you want to listen for the needs behind what they're saying. You want to make sure you hear, you have the opportunity to sort of say back to them what it is you're hearing. So you can hear that somebody is so mad that that lunch got closed at 1.01 p.m. and they showed up at 1.02 p.m. and now they don't have lunch. And the needs are, this, this, first of all, this person needs a meal. This person could just be hangry. This person needs to feel like you have heard them and you are so quick to say, I, I hear you. It is so frustrating. You, you're really mad because you showed up here. It's only a minute after lunch was closed and they won't even give you a plate. Is that right? And, and the more you can kind of make sure that they know that you get them, it may not be the words that they're saying, but you can still find whatever that underlying need is, the easier it will be to communicate. And again, the easier, easier it will be for them to feel and to maintain that feeling that they can trust you. Um, you do, of course, want to maintain a distance and a calm voice. 
we've covered that it's not about you, but I feel like we should have put this at the next three bullet points. You know, we, we as outreach workers don't get to have bad days that we bring with us, but we need to be prepared to deal with other people's bad days. We're not going to try to separate any people in a physical altercation. That is not our job. That becomes a law enforcement issue or for other people in the camp to sort out, but it is not, not, not your job. And again, and we touched on this briefly, how can we tie whatever the conflict is back to housing? So you're sick and tired of people snoring. Well, let's get you into your own place. You think the food at the shelter sucks. Great. Well, you know where we could get you, where you can be cooking your own meals each and every day? A place of your own. What can we do to make that happen? Um, there, there is an endless list of ways that we can connect back whatever somebody's primary issue is to a solution that starts with the housing process. So to close out, Let's talk about how we know our programs are going to work. As we said, outreach has a long and storied history of not working particularly well because we measured it by how many people we talked to or how many contacts we made or how many pairs of socks we gave out. But we didn't ever talk about how we ended somebody's homelessness. So when we measure success in our outreach programs, what, what we can tell you in the first year, in the first 10 months of this most recent program we've started is that we've moved 118 people into permanent housing. We've made 75 people document ready. That tells us that they're closer to housing. We connected nearly 100 people with the coordinated entry system, which means they are on a daily basis being considered for housing. Uh, we, we measure, um, referrals from the community. We actually have a program with the Gainesville Police Department where somebody calls in and they say, there's a homeless guy on the side of the road. I'm worried about him. A year ago, they were sending cops out to deal with that. Cops are not social workers. Cops get forced into situations sometimes where they're expected to be social workers, but social workers will always be better social workers than law enforcement officers. And likewise, you're not a law enforcement officer. So um, when we're measuring success, we're also looking at how many times we prevented police from having to respond to what is a non-criminal issue. It's a person sleeping outside or peeing outside or drinking outside. Uh, we measure success by looking at how long people are homeless, how long from the first time you speak with them and enter them into the program until they're housed. And this will vary. There's no right number here. Sometimes it's 50 days, sometimes it's 100 days, but at the, at the end of this, you'll have an answer for, on average, when we send our street outreach team out, we can get somebody into housing in about 80 days, compared to the old model when we didn't have street outreach and people never got housed. Um, at the community level, you can look at how many people are living unsheltered. Uh, as I said, using point in time data, we know that the number of people without shelter in our community is down 69% since, since 2014. We also know that visible downtown homelessness is down 25% since this most recent incarnation of our outreach team started. And of course, you can measure increases in income and increases in mainstream benefits, Anything, again, that will show progress toward housing, considering that so many folks had been not even dealt with previously. They'd been pretty much in a community, they get written off as unhousable or unwilling to move into housing. The more we can do to document the transition from homelessness to housing and the successes that we see, the more support we can get politically, the more support we can get financially, and the more support we can get, all of that translates into increased staffing and increased opportunities to place people into permanent housing. So up to this point, we've covered what housing plans look like. We've covered uh, Outreach 101 and the best practices involved, particularly harm reduction, trauma-informed care, progressive engagement, and motivational interviewing. Uh, we've talked about contact and rapport building engagements. We've talked about emergency engagements, and we've talked about housing-focused engagements. We've talked about the outreach workflow from rapport building to the initial housing conversations 
to uh, making progress towards housing, exiting somebody from the program, and then follow up and follow up care. Uh, housing plans, how to advocate for somebody at the coordinated entry level, how to stay safe and how to help keep other people safe through harm reduction. Uh, very, very brief conflict de-escalation 101 and metrics for success to tell if your program is working or if it is not working. So with that, we have about 20 minutes left for questions and answers. And I've got a little bit more time than that if it runs over. And so wanted to go ahead and turn it over to you to see what questions you may have. Any questions from the group? I'm looking at our chat as well and I'm not seeing any there at the moment. I'm not seeing any at this point. Um, I, I do think the, the measure of success is key. Um, oftentimes we collect number of contacts, but what, what does that mean? So I think that really kind of sends that message home to us as well. Um, if there's anyone on chat. How do we handle people who want to continue to help but do not focus on housing? And I think if, if I'm understanding correctly, so, so at what point do you engage with somebody who says, I'd love it if you keep bringing me tents and sleeping bags, but I'm not interested in moving into housing? Is that correct? I can answer this one. Um, at, at some point in time, uh, you, you have to draw the boundary of, uh, of our program and our resources are dedicated towards um, helping people get housed. Um, if if um, it is a toothbrush that you need, um, you're more than welcome to go to the local shelter and see if they can provide you with a toothbrush. Um, knowing your local resources and being able to refer people to those resources that already exist is essential, especially in a situation in which someone doesn't work towards housing. So. And, and I think we might be answering the wrong question now that um, Ms. Bryant oh. has, yeah, I, I, I got it now. See but, the second half? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but I do want to say on the assumption that somebody says they don't want housing, that's fine. You're not going to spend most of your time with them, but you're going to continue to be seen as somebody trustworthy. And eventually they're going to see you house their friend and they're going to say, hey, you know what? I didn't think you had anything to offer me when I first met you two years ago, but now I see you doing good stuff. And now I think I'd be ready to talk to you about housing. Now to the question about how do you handle people who want to continue to, I'll call it provide services to homeless people, but are only focusing on giving out meals or giving out toiletry kits. Um, on one hand, there's a couple ways to answer that. And there's a couple ways you can use that to your advantage. I, um, we, we've dealt with this. I've been doing this work for 25 years. And, you know, I have had to have so many conversations with people who want to come out to our campus and they want to do, you know, whatever. They want to do board game night at the, the homeless shelter or they want to do, they want to install a pool table. And we have to have conversations to say, look, you know, this is not a place where we want people to stay forever. You're, what you're doing is kind of making it easier for people to stay here forever. On the other hand, as an outreach worker, you can use this to your advantage. So, so, so if they're putting out, if they show up every Sunday and they serve meals and you know that, well then great. Half the people you're probably looking for are already hanging out in that place. And so you can go and it becomes an easier opportunity to find people you may not have been able to get in touch with, or you can talk to 10 people in the amount of time you would have previously been able to talk to three people because you were going all over town looking for them. Um, on the other hand, you know, it takes some of the burden off of you. If you show up and they say, somebody says, look, I'm not even going to talk to you till you give me a sandwich then instead of you having to run across the street and buying them a sandwich and coming back, you can say, hey, good news. That group that's here every Sunday at seven is should be here in about 10 minutes. So I'll just hang out here and wait with you and then let's get a plate of food together. So um, Jacqueline, I think some of this comes down to 
what do you as an outreach worker have control over and what do you not have control over? There will always be the, the teach a man to fish versus give a man a fish fights. And you may never win those fights, but what you can do is keep doing what you're doing. And eventually what we have happened is those groups come back and they say, man, you just moved this guy into housing that we thought would be homeless forever, or we thought he was going to die on the streets. Where is he now? And we say, well, I can't tell you where he lives, but he's been in housing since last May. And so it's, it's you know, how to navigate what different providers are doing is the job of the continuum of care and the job of local communities. Um, in, in many ways, though, I think that the answer is simply use it to your advantage how you can, and then you know, be grateful that somebody else is doing that and you don't have to do that. We have one question in the audience. We just want to help. Cynthia, if the question is right. being asked, I can't yeah. hear it. Any way you can I'm relay it to us? I, I will summarize it for you. Um, the question is, we have someone here that's with our downtown Reno partnership, with our downtown ambassadors. Um, and it sounds like from in his previous role, he provided a lot of the services beforehand and helping individuals get help with, was it substance abuse or child? Social, uh, social services, essentially. His question is now with, based on the conversation we had today, it's starting with housing and then getting someone to get the additional help. How can someone reframe that if they've professionally done that work in the opposite um, order? Does that help? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And I'm going to, with, with a preamble of, Mark is a guy who used to come to our shelter simply to help people with social security and disability applications for years. And then we came over to run our outreach teams about a year ago, I think is uniquely qualified to how do you respond to that when people just insist you help them with the thing you used to do? So, um... I can, I can tell you um, for, for sure that, uh, for example, when I was doing the social security work, um, I would lose track of people all the time. Um, and that's because um, they, they were hard to locate. Um, and if someone was able to get inside first, then um, it was so much easier to help them with their social security benefits after that. I think the key is just, once somebody has an address, it's so much easier to help them with wraparound services. And, and wraparound services ensure that the person um, remains inside as well, because it's not just housing, it's permanency once, in house, once they are housed. Um, it's just so much easier for a uh, service provider to provide services to a person who is inside. And and that said, answers it, but well, know. you know, there's there's another piece though too that when we're talking about the goal being housing, you don't need to prevent somebody from getting substance abuse treatment because they don't have a house. You know, I would certainly ask the question of what your success rate had been previously in terms of unsheltered people going into treatment or recovery services, then being discharged from a rehab facility into unsheltered homelessness and how likely they were to maintain any form of recovery as they were living outside in those same crisis situations. But, um, you know, as we know from working with people in the substance abuse and, and mental health fields for years, um, there's something to be said for striking when the iron is hot. And I don't want to say to somebody that, 
well, hey, you don't have a house yet, therefore you don't deserve this service. But, you know, would you mind if while you're away in treatment, could we keep working on getting you into an apartment so that when you graduate, you would be able to exit into a place of your own? Or how can we work on building up additional supports for you, which would include housing, so that when you come out of here, you're not sleeping on the ground right next to your old dealer? And also it's, it's too, um, it's a switching your frame of thinking from um, substance abuse treatment or mental health tre treatment being a prerequisite for housing is, is not okay. So it's basically just the, the idea that we are focused on housing, but we can focus on other things at the same time. We just want to make sure that there's no barrier in front of them being housed. So for example, I can work on the social security application while I'm trying to find them a home at the same time. Um, it, it's, it's okay. Um, the idea is just to not have any barriers in front of housing, like prerequisites for mental health or substance abuse treatment. Yeah. And I want to bring up one point that I didn't touch on as much as I had intended to. And that's the difference between, I know a lot of you are involved in um, very support oriented outreach activities. And then there is some element of what the clean and safe team does and some, some element of what the, the downtown partnership does that's involved in asking people to move along. And it's involved in, you know, it's call it what you will, but closing down camps or sweeping camps. And how do we maintain, how do we build rapport when we're doing that? And, and the answer is, it's very, very difficult to do. And you have to be very, very careful. So an ideal situation would be that one organization or agency or department is involved in the cleanup work or in the enforcement work. And they are completely and totally separated from the name of the agency to the color of the uniforms to the approach as the people who are there working on housing. That's, that's sort of the ideal. Now, the reality is sometimes you are going to find yourself in the position where you are coordinating with law enforcement and where you are coordinating with downtown business owners. And what has worked well for us, and we try to stay out of this wherever possible. Mark does a great job of trying to keep us out of this. I do a terrible job of accidentally stumbling us into this sometimes. But we have had wild success with um, kind of positioning the outreach team as the initial wave of people who go out. And basically you're coming in and you're saying, hey, look, I'm John, I'm here with Grace. I am, I, I, what I know is that the cops are gonna show up tomorrow at noon to clear this place out. I really wanna be able to find you when that happens. I really wanna know that you're not gonna get arrested. I'm not telling you, you've gotta go. But I'm telling you, if you didn't want to get arrested or you didn't want any trouble, it might make sense to get out of here today um, so that you don't have to have any additional contacts with law enforcement because you know that never goes well. And I want to try to keep you as safe as possible. So there are ways that you can position it, but the person providing support should can never be the person enforcing laws or ordinances or any other kind of thing that somebody might see as a threat to their own well-being. So that's going to be critically important and you all can decide internally how you might switch that but you know if one person pulls up on a Segway and says here's a sandwich and here's some socks and here's a housing application and the next person who pulls up on a Segway says if you don't leave by five o'clock you're going to get arrested Remember what we said about building rapport cumulatively and collectively? There has to be a difference between those two functions in your outreach programs. John, that's a, that's a great point. We have a new partnership with um, a nonprofit organization and we've been attempting to model that, um, but I think that kind of provide some guidance on for us and how we organize, organize just how we operate in, out in the field. The other thing to add on to that too is, um, cause yeah, we, we definitely interact a lot with municipalities like uh, code enforcement or the fire department or um, the police department. And um, as the, the team supervisor, I kind of take that on as my role so that my team can be totally separate from that 
and be out on the, on, you know, in the field, on the ground, taking care of stuff. And they don't have the direct interactions with the municipalities or the police department, et cetera. That's mainly me. And what, it, what I have to do is um, emphasize over and over again that just like oftentimes homelessness um, or becoming homeless is a slow process, oftentimes moving someone into a home is a slow process. So we're not going to just show up and tell somebody to leave because that um, defeats the purpose of our positions, which is to try and house somebody for the long run and to actually solve this long this problem that's been existing for a long time. Um, and it, it first off, it was a tough conversation and there wasn't a lot of people that listened, but um, just hammering it home over and over and over again to the people that send you referrals is is essential and eventually they get it and they know what you're trying to do and they buy into it i, I don't see any additional questions but i just have a very um basic <laughs> best practices question in your community um do you all hand out like say like a little a rat cart or a flyer with resources have those been successful there um, we've discussed printing some here internally. I find yeah, that they just get tossed, but I, I could be wrong. So just looking for insight. I, it depends on how useful it is. Um, mm -hmm. if it's, if it's just resources. Then sometimes that's actually, I have, I have one behind me one second. And I'll <laughs> yeah. You know, I will say we we've had those for almost 20 years, Cynthia. And um, at first it was just, it was, it was ridiculous. It was a list of like things like, here's where you go to get eyeglasses, but it was printed in six point font. So you couldn't yeah. even read it if you actually needed eyeglasses. And what we did now, or what we do now is one side of the card is a list of all the meals that are available. It's a list of all of the shelters in town. And I'll send you, I have a PDF of it that I can send you so you can see it. On the other okay. side is a list of your rights on the street which say, here is where it's okay, you, you know, when do the parks close? Um, is it okay to drink outside? Is it okay to ask people for money? What are the conditions on that? And the orientation is more, hey, we wanna help you stay out of trouble as much as possible. So it's kind of um, targeted to, it's clear that it's targeted to people so that we're trying to support them while they're dealing with their crisis. Um, and I'd be happy to send you the version that we use now. Whether or not they have actually been more successful than word of mouth, I'll tell you, my gut says it's pretty much a good feel good exercise for the continuum of care to do. Um, that said, it's a fair question to ask if somebody says, hey, I don't know what resources there are, they shouldn't have to run into the one person in town who can tell them every resource or be expected to go online. So if we can hand them a large print card that does collect all of the resources they may need, it's a good start. Yeah. And this this is the format that we use. I don't know if you all can see it, but it's got opens up, it's got useful numbers and then there's maps and things like that to show where meal sites are so it's very basic but yeah it's mixed reviews i think um they get tossed sometimes other people really utilize them um so i don't think it's a bad bad thing to do um it doesn't hurt let me put it that way <laughs> thank you are there any other questions Seeing other questions, John and Mark, this was fantastic. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having us and for giving us the opportunity to share um, different ways to make what you're doing more effective. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any other questions. Um, all we want is to see your street outreach programs get awesome, and we're happy to help in any way. John, great. can I give, give you my direct number if you need it as well? That would be great. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone that joined. Um, this training was recorded, so we'll make sure to share that information along with the content, which was really um, helpful. All right. Well, thanks, y'all. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.